Hello and welcome to The Last Word on Spurs. We hope you're keeping very, very safe and well. Have you recovered yet from Sunday? I doubt it. I don't think we have ever a last word on Spurs. We're still getting going. If you're listening to the show for the first time, you can find us on iTunes. We're on Spotify. We're on Audio Boom. We're across a range of different audio platforms. We're, of course, on Twitter at Last Word on Spurs. We're on Facebook and Instagram, too. As I can see by my besotted audience, wonderful guests, special guests in particular. We are also live on YouTube for a season review, which I know all of us can now look back and think, oh, wasn't that all worth going through for all of what we've been through? So uh, we can't wait to get into another jam-packed show. Thank you so much, as always. Wonderful watching audience here on Last Word on Spurs. We're battling the Europa Conference League final. What should we be worried about at all? What should we be worried about? Joining us on this great show, back alongside me, I've got my co-host, the crazy instructor of our crazy train, Mr. Lee McQueen, who's pulling up the coal. Lee, we're coming towards the end, or we are at the end, and we've got a new season Not that quick, but coming very soon. It's just the beginning, Rick. It is the beginning of the new era. I mean, what an absolute barnstorming week we've had as Tottenham fans and fully deserved. I don't care. All the rival fans can be in here if they want to mock me, but fully deserved. We've got top top four. Um, Kane's going to have a little little, uh, release of that contract that I've been banging on about for the last nine months that he's going to sign. Uh, Antonio Conte is bound to get an extension now. There's a war chest, as Ali as Ali reported earlier this week. The big war chest is out. I mean, what an absolutely fantastic end to the season. I mean, battering them that lot down the road 3-0. Um, the catalyst, I think, for that. The, the fans have been amazing since, I mean, uh, everyone goes to all the games, uh, you know, certainly at home. And obviously, Ali travels home and away and everywhere else. As does friends of the show, Chris Cowlin, etc. And it's just been... John was, I think, was at night, weren't you, on the final day, John, yourself. So I just think the fans have been amazing and just captivated everything. And that news yesterday about um, an ink with 150 million, just just brilliant. Just, I mean, I know we were waiting, looking over our shoulders, weren't we, thinking, hang on a minute, when's that going to go wrong? But it's not. It's the turning time. It's just the beginning of a new era. And I'm really, really looking forward to, to reviewing the season, actually, because you forget, wow, what a crazy train of a season it has been. Yeah, no, absolutely. Now it's been great, Lee, sharing it with you every single week. I want to say we've enjoyed every week, but uh, I can tell you I can't wait for <laughs> to have a break. It's been a long, long season. Joining Lee back on last word on Spurs, two of course of our regulars on the show as well. I know a man that's waiting for that transfer window to be open, and I know he catting down the hours, second minutes. Jamie Brown over at the Delhi Hotspur. Jay, how are you, mate? It's a very exciting time at the moment. It is indeed. Um, yeah, I'm very good, Ricky, and I uh, hope all the listeners are good as well. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just an amazing time at the club, really. I mean, I remember back to last year, at this this point from last year, it was just a complete and utter, you know, contrast from where we are now. And it's just it's just incredibly nice to see everyone on social media, you know, on all different platforms from Spurs fans. And just kind of everyone seems so united at the moment and, and just, um, you know, real direction of, of where the club's going and, and, and really exciting times and what an end to the season it was. Um, you know, getting into that top four. And as you said, lots to look forward to now for Spurs in terms of the transfer window um, and, of course, the next season as well. So, um, yeah, really, really exciting time to be a Spurs fan again. Yeah, I'm just conscious by the time we do this intro, it will be the end of the show at this rate. <laughs> I'm I told you the, man, the main man in yet. <laughs> 15 pages long, we've not even done the intro yet. Also joining us, listen, he's brilliant, runs a great pod. I really like Rose of the Youth. John Wedden's back on last one on Spurs. John, you are beaming from ear to ear. The excitement in the house, John. Yeah, mate, I am absolutely buzzing. I mean, it was a reward for the hard work Antonio Conte put in. Huge credit as well to some of the less mentioned players, the likes of Dyer and Davis, that really stepped up towards that course of the season and got us over the line. Also, big Davidson Sanchez, who came in, you know, without Romero for those last three games. So, yeah, the whole atmosphere around Tottenham is really, really high at the moment. It's quite similar to on the back of or on the lead up to that Champions League final in 2019 with those three weeks of just joy as Tottenham fans when everyone was so happy to see each other. It was an exciting new dawn amongst us and hopefully we can really pick up this time and take off in the summer window. So, yeah, really buzzing to support Tottenham at the moment. Really good energy around the place and uh, I'm still recovering, actually. I felt like a, a car wreck on uh, on Monday after the drinking. Try and keep up drinking my crackers to Norwich and back, I'll tell you. <laughs> I was feeling it, mate. But, uh, yeah, buzzing, absolutely buzzing. Really exciting. Ali keeps putting out these videos. Lots of excitement around Tottenham. So, yeah, just can't wait for the season and uh, already looking forward to the pre-season. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Just, I think it's been out these videos and we've got to try and stay calm. We've got him on there. 
<laughs> We've got, listen, the brilliant, if you don't know who this man is, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? Listen, um, we've got the wonderful Tottenham Hotspur correspondent for Football London, a man that I think we've all been glued to him over the past, God knows how many years, back again for an end of season review, which you could be for four and a half hours. Joke. We've got the brilliant Ali Gold over at Football.London. Ali, thank you for gracing of your t- gracing of your time, which I understand is a day off. Thank you so much. It's an absolute pleasure. <clears throat> you know, I always enjoy doing this. It's always good fun. And to be honest, you got me hyped up. Those three intros are incredible. Honestly, I'm just buzzing now. About the, if I wasn't buzzing about the season, and we've also thrown Big Dav, Big Davinson Sanchez chucked in the intro, which I didn't even expect. Honestly, love a bit of Davinson Sanchez. So uh, no, I'm raring to go. Go on, let's get cracking into these 15 pages of script you've got for me. <laughs> we almost said it. Just funny, Ali hasn't been here on the nights we did the Europa Conference League reviews. I can tell you, Ali, the intros weren't as great. As on the, uh, yeah, definitely the Europa Conference League nights, we got really carried away. And the funny thing, I think we're recording on the final of the Europa Conference League, and there's already over a thousand of you plus watching us live on Last Word on Spurs. Thank you so much for all of your incredible support throughout the season. Uh, I have to say, today we've hit the milestone already of one million views on Last Word on Spurs on YouTube. We've only been going for like the last eight months. So thank you so much for all of your incredible support. It's these guys here you see week in, week out, and the brilliant Ali Gold that's come on throughout the season that's helped us achieve that and a wonderful audience. So thank you so much. Ali, now um, we did put out a listener question uh, tweet beforehand, which did, I think, got about 150, 200 questions. So you can appreciate everybody. You won't go, be able to go through all those questions. Otherwise, you won't get, get through the 15 and a half pages of the script. But um, <laughs> the, the most common question, Ali, coming up from many people is, <laughs> when's your go next on. holiday? You I, next knew holiday? I knew it. I knew that was going to be the Can't one. you go off already and give us a chance? Uh, I knew it. Honestly, that is probably... The most asked question I get on on Twitter every single day. Um, I do have a holiday planned in the transfer window. Might try and sneak in another weekend as well. So don't worry, it will happen. It will happen. But to be honest, I think they're going to try and do so many transfers. I think they're going to spread them out anyway this summer. So I don't think you have to even worry about it being my holiday. Okay. That's uh, so good to me now, Ali. I think people now are going to try and get a GoFundMe page going just to kind of get you away as much as possible. <laughs> so it will actually stop you from doing any form of any updates on Spurs Weekly. But um, I must just say very quickly, a quick shout out to our sponsors tonight over at the Beavertown Corner Pin. That's the Beavertown Bang opposite the state, South Stand. They've been doing some great home win away um, televised games this season. We've been down there for Liverpool away. I know John has had a really good time down there. We were there for the uh, build up to the Arsenal game. Honestly, the atmosphere in there was absolutely insanity. I know the high street was crazy. Beaver Town itself was mad. Lee McQueen's been on the laser crush back to the neck oils and likewise vice versa. So listen, go and check them out. Great food, great company. Beaver Town Corner Pin, thank you so much for incredible support. Right, Ali, it's time to go. We're going to get straight into it. Ali, we've come back of a season where Quite frankly, how do we go with this? Well, we sacked Jose Mourinho. We had Harry Kane wanting to leave. We then spent three months looking for a manager that included Gattuso and Fonseca. We saw you go like this at one point, which will only apply to listeners on audio. Um, lost 3-0 to Manchester United. We then sacked Nuno. We then saw Antonio Conte took over. We were ninth. The confidence was absolutely rock, rock bottom. Six months later, we've improved so many players, Antonio Conte, that's not we, and Spurs are in the Champions League. Tell me... How do you sum up that craziness of a season which has finally come to an end? I think just I sum it up by all the extra white hairs in my beard, quite frankly. Just what a ridiculous season. Just you reading that out. That's like a decade in a season, isn't it? It's just so absurd. And only Tottenham Hotspur could do that. You know, the amount of... How do you go from Nuno to Conte, from your Conference League to Champions League, from Kane scoring barely a goal at the start of the season to scoring a hatful in the second half of the season. It's just incredible. Absolutely incredible season. And yeah, it is. It's Spurs. It's just given, from a personal perspective, I had so much to report on. Honestly, sometimes I think back to the pandemic and when we had no football for three or four months and I'm scratching around thinking of articles to write. Spurs have just guaranteed, I think they've made up for it. I think they've just decided the last 12 months or so, do you know what? We're going to give you an absolute nightmare summer with the most weirdest managerial search ever. We're going to end that with a manager who's going to say about five words to you in press conferences, and then he's going to be gone in three months. And then, you know what? We'll make up for it. We'll bring in one of the best managers in the world, and we'll absolutely smash it and get to the end of the season, finish fourth somehow. 
I still don't know how they went from that utter mess to the fourth best team in the land. It's just incredible. And now, you know, we go back to the land of, you know, the Bernabeu, the new Camp and all of that and these big nights. It's just going to be incredible. And I have absolutely no idea how we've gone from, you know, the glamour nights of Moura to, to back to the, maybe the Bernabeu and stuff like that. It's, it's incredible. Yeah, totally agree. Uh, Lee, I mean, listen, this season we've seen definitive proof that adversity brings with it a real opportunity and that mistakes don't always define your season if you move quickly enough to atone them. Now, it has been an incredible job by Antonio Conte. Spurs were seven points adrift after that loss of Burnley and quite frankly, we looked dead and buried. But we went on then to win 10 of our last 14 remaining games. Could you imagine, Lee, if Conte took over in the summer? I mean, how do you sum up, Lee, what's been a crazy season? Well, I think it's the crazy train, isn't it? I mean, let's be honest about it, viewers and listeners. It is. Um, I mean, it's just absolutely mad. When you when you recite it back like that, you just think, really, has that happened this year? Like, has that happened this season? I mean, it's not even a year, is it? It's only just like nine months or whatever. It's absolutely mad. Um, it's frightening. I tell you what, it's frightening what you can do from the beginning of the season. That was your look, that was the last part of your question. And and I've got some immense stats that I'll blow you away with later when we get to page 15. Uh, of the script because I, I'm I'm mega I'm mega buzzing. And people say don't get carried away. I am getting carried away. This bloke's a real deal. I mean, this, this geezer wins league titles, um, and you know for what he's done. You know, I, I remember writing in, in our WhatsApp group that I think it was just for the Everton game when we smashed them five nil. I think we had to win something like thirteen games out of a possible fifteen or something like that to. We always talked about getting 72 points will get you the top four, like over the last 12 uh, average points total over the last, last 12 seasons. So we were kind of aiming for that 72 points, but obviously it's proved right again, wasn't it? Um, and, and he virtually did it. Like with them stats that you just said, it's absolutely incredible. I mean, I think, how many games has he lost? Six. Did he lose six games in the league? I think he lost six games in the league for, for off the top of my head. Which, which, quite frankly, is is pretty. You know, you look at it in, in context. We lost twice, three times, didn't we, against Chelsea? Yeah. Um, you know, and you're thinking, oh man, it, it is not turning this around. But wow, I mean, that that uh, draw was it on New Year's Day or the day after New Year's Day against Southampton, or was it a boxing at like 29th or 30th of December? Saint where I was in Mexico, and he, and they had a man sent off, didn't they? And we only still only drew one one, and you're thinking, oh, you know, we're not going to get over the line, but. This guy just, I, I mean, obviously as a Spurs fan, we all remember this in the 16-17 season when we got a record points, so 86 points. And Chelsea just went on some ridiculous run, which yep. obviously Deli Alley um, ended with two headers, didn't he? Um, but I think they won 15 games in the Premier League on the trot, Chelsea. And that, that's the colour of the guy, right? We've, we've yep. got this manager. This is, I'm, I'm buzzing for it. Like To get top four, like people saying it's not a trophy... And I love the way that Antonio Conte has come in and said, we are aiming to get to the top four. I love that. Absolutely. It's been managing the part. Oh, no, you know, let's take one game at a time. No, I want to see him say, no, we're ambitious and we want to go. And I also love the fact that he got the players talking about it. We want top four. Sonny, for, for I don't know, somebody might correct me, Ali, you might know better, better than me. You interview these guys. But, you know, Sonny he was talking at least five, six weeks before the end of the season, I want Champions League football. That is where we want to be. And, you know, I love that. I think that's fantastic. So the mentality is changing, the, the hunger, everything, the desire, it's just it's just phenomenal, mate. This, this guy's, he's in Italy somewhere. He's walking on water somewhere, I think. You know. <laughs> Daniel Levy and Paratigi is just kind of going over there going, what do you need, Antonio? Like, he, he's done yes. amazing, amazing. It is crazy. Uh, to Sunilla there, Lord Alistair Gold of Tottenham Hotspur. We bow before the <laughs> LWS team for putting together this panel. Appreciate the effort. Listen, uh, thank you so much for all the support. Thank you to Ali who's joined us on a day off. Although it feels like Ali, there's never a day off in his life. Whether it's Spurs or even we're even now getting holiday videos, which I tell you, what, Ali, my wife absolutely loves. So we will take that off air at some <laughs> point when you've got five minutes. Um, John. Coming around to you, listen, since the arrival of Conte, Spurs, we amassed and took 56 points. Yeah, Only Premier League champions, City and runners-up Liverpool picked up more during that period. We scored 60 goals and kept 13 collegiates in 28 games, eight wins, two duels from our final 11. Yeah, what did you make, John, of how Spurs performed across the season, but especially when Conte took control? It has just been a crazy topsy-turvy season, right? 
Yeah, I kind of see it as two seasons. I, I think the form since Kulovetsky and Benson Ford joined in, you know, January, they didn't play till February. Um, the form since then has been absolutely phenomenal. I also think to myself, had we not got those players over the line in those last hours of that window, we would have really been looking, with Oli Skip's injury, at Winks playing a lot of those games. I'm not trying to dig certain players out, but quite simply, we wouldn't have been in the top four with Winks playing those fixtures instead of Benzincourt and how much he actually brought to the team in terms of his leadership, his quality. And when we got down to that final couple of games, I thought to myself, this is a guy who's won three Scudettos in Serie A. This is a guy who knows about getting over the line. And at Norwich, you just have to look at how cool and calm he was. Um, he's been there. He's done these pressure environments. And he, he led the show from midfield, Benzincourt. And I just think that added to Kulovetsky, who gets the plaudits because he scores the goals and assists. And the return on him has been absolutely phenomenal. To me, he's like a, a hybrid, a little bit of Harry and Sonny in one player, where he's got that build and physique and strength and then he cuts in and can finish like, like Sonny does. So I just think those signings have been fantastic, but also the improvement in the likes of Ben Davis. I mean, Eric Dyer was already doing very, very well under Nuno, but a continued improvement. Um, and we've seen those players, as I mentioned earlier, that have come in, uh, even off the bench, offering something. So I've just been so impressed with the actual management ability of Conte and how he's managed to get the best out of his players. And I remember last year when Chelsea first brought in Tuchel, I very sort of jealously was looking on at the difference he made with the same group of players. But we've seen exactly that. Antonio has done that for Tottenham. I'm really excited now for him to get this second season, to get this pre-season of the players he wants, get the players working for him. And um, I, I think there's so much to look forward to Tottenham at the moment. Even actually, if we didn't sign anybody, I think we'd really push on next season. I just think having that pre-season with Antonio to learn his methods further, look, lo and behold, it sounds like we are pushing ahead. We are going to bring people in, so that's even better. But I just think Conte is such a, a top-level manager. It's such a coup we've even got him in the Premier League and at Tottenham Hotspur. There is just so much to look forward to. So huge credit to the work he's done. Uh, I think the, the game against Arsenal is obviously the decisive one. Um, their game against Palace a couple of weeks earlier to that was the, the pre for that game. You know, We saw that when they went up in a nighttime fixture, in a big atmosphere with the fans playing their part, they crumbled under that pressure. We saw them then do it in the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. Huge credit to our support for really making that a carnival-like atmosphere. And then they also suffered, obviously, a defeat at Newcastle under similar surroundings. So, you know, the mixture of just great form by Tottenham and seeing that young Arsenal team wilt that I thought was really, really important because we couldn't have them with this young core of kind of homegrown players they've mainly got at Arsenal. Credit to them for doing that. Um, you know, getting in the top four. It was vital that not only did we get in, but we also shut the door on them. And I think we have done that. And I'm really looking forward to our investments over this summer and improving and going again next season. Yeah, I'm in. Completely agree. Uh, I must just say, guys, I know people are saying, you know, ask Ali's transfer names, ask Ali. Yeah, I must say, we, we are here trying to do what we do in a season review. Now, off it, Ali very kindly said, hey, you can throw in a couple of names. So, listen, I promise you, we might throw in a couple of names throughout the show, but the purpose of this one is just to review the season because, um, as you guys know, on last one on Spurs, such is the nature from you know, two shows a week, we don't always get the chance to look back on what has been a crazy chaotic season. And of course, the cash injection at Spurs. There's a lot to cover with Ali, who's given us a lot of his time. So we just want to try and use that wisely. <laughs> Hopefully as wisely as Spurs use the transfer budget this summer. No pressure, Daniel Levy, Fabio Paretta, G and co. Right, Jamie, come over to you. Um, five goals conceded by Spurs in their final 11 games. Probably a massive reason why Spurs have ended up with a top four finish. And amazing given how much criticism there's been over our defence. You know, when you look back under Nuno, under Pochettino, uh, before that, of course, Mourinho too. Um, and also the fact Spurs, six points plus one game behind on fourth with 11 to go. We made that up between eight and 18 points against Chelsea and the three teams below over 11 games. Was it really all down to Conte for you, Jay, that Spurs managed to execute a Champions League spot in the end? Yeah, well, I mean, if you look at that Manchester United game, Nuno's final game in charge and kind of the atmosphere there and, and, and how we've been playing up until that point and you compare it to now, it's just unbelievable the, the difference that's been made. So I don't think it's any coincidence that, you know, he's come in and made such a difference. So, of course, a lot of, um, you know, a lot of the, uh, uh, of the Spurs' success over the last couple of months has, has certainly been a lot of come down to him. But I think the players do deserve a lot of credit as well. I think a lot of them have come into the team at maybe difficult moments and really stepped up. I mean, obviously, there has been players that have been consistent, um, the likes of Eric Dyer, Ben Davis, all players that have been really key in Conte's system. Um, then, of course, you've had players that maybe come in in difficult circumstances. Of course, when we lost Matt Doherty to injury, who was playing really well up until that point, you know, we were all worried about who was going to come in at right wing back. And, of course, Emerson Royal comes in. He's had a very difficult season, but in those games that he played, I thought he was really competent in those games. And it was just kind of players coming in and, and, and doing those jobs 
Um, and, and, and just, you know, and again, it was consistent performances from some of them. Players coming into difficult circumstances and really making a difference. So the players do definitely deserve a lot of credit um, for, for the job they've done. But again, it's, you know, Conte, again, and just the difference that he's made since since that game against Manchester United and up until now, it's just incredible. Um, also, you know, the turnaround since that Burnley defeat, I think we'd won uh, 10 of out 40 matches or so. I mean, that's just like unbelievable, you know, unbelievable record. And again, you look, you know, with the third most informed uh, side of the league since Conte arrived. So, you know, just so much to be kind of proud of, of this season. And um, I think next season is going to just be even better. I mean, look, this was almost kind of a pre-season of Conte. We've managed to secure Champions League football, which is so important. And even in this season, we've had, you know, this feels like there's so many like key components of a Conte side missing. You know, you still feel as though wing-backs to come, top wing-backs to come in. Um, and I, th I think when you start adding those key components of a Conte system into the side, then I think it's going to be really, really exciting next year. I mean, I, me I remember coming out from a lot of those top performances and thinking, well, look, if he's doing it with this set of players, if you get him, give him the right tools to go, you know, even better tools, then it's really exciting what you can do. And, um, you know, as we've obviously been seeing with Alice, Alice's videos, you know, incredibly exciting of, of what's to come. And, and they certainly look like they're going to give him the tools. So, um I'm I'm very excited for, for next season. Oh man, oh man. Now we know it's been a crazy last couple of days with Spurs, and I think when you again you summarise, you know, Conte managed to take Tottenham from a seventh place then to 62 point finish in 2021 uh, to a fourth place finish 71 points despite arriving mid season. Spurs remember were in ninth and having only two tries in the January window, a rough spending of 40 million once all is finalised. Ali probably confirmed that figure to be better than what I've just judged that, but it was 26 points out of a possible 33 with a plus 22 goal difference in 11 games. Again, it just really proves the fact, Conte, the metal that he's shown, you know, he, we judge managers maybe on that two points per game. And joining Spurs is worth 76 points over a season if you judge how Conte's come in and made that difference. And that's what I'll give you for third place. So it just shows you that give him what he wants and he'll give you a team that wins. And that brings us very nicely on um, to the news in the last, well, 24 hours, which has got all Spurs fans very excited. And I think Ali's videos have just sent us into complete overdrive. If I could put that in the most politest way possible, because um, it does feel only coming over to you that in terms of giving him what he wants, we've seen the club announcement that there's going to be a 150 million cash injection. Um, in your recent pieces, or one of them, you explained in detail how that injection, how that would look for Spurs, for Conte, for Paratigi in terms of the summer plans. Should we be all excited, Ali, for a very big summer? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, it's fantastic. Because, you know, I, I was told, yeah, it wasn't long after the match against Norwich. I was told, because obviously, I think we all went away to journals. We did our digging to find out kind of what was going to come next. And the same thing was coming back from everyone I asked this question of. It was, yeah, they're back in contact big time. They are absolutely back in it. And I'm trying to think, okay, so where's the money coming from? Obviously, they're going to a full season in the stadium. There's going to be revenue from that. That's, that's good. Champions League money. But I'm still thinking, is that big money? And everyone just was so confident. I was thinking, there's money coming from somewhere else. I was wondering whether the naming rights, I was kind of asking around about that. And then here we go, well, a couple of days later, we find out exactly what it is. Enoch chucking this £150 million in. Um, it's, it's one of those where, ultimately, I think Enoch, uh, we understand they're borrowing the money, to put it in. It, it's an investment from them. And it's one that I think, certainly more intelligent financial types than me, think that they'll should do very well out of it at the end of it if they ever decide to sell uh, the uh, the club. But ultimately, it's one of those scenarios where it's a bit like, who cares? <laughs> because right now, all the fans will care about, and quite rightly, is that, that 150 million, I'm told that pretty much all of it is going to go into the summer transfer budget. And that's, that's it, isn't it. You get that, you get the money recouped from sales, you get the Champions League revenue as well, whatever budget they originally had as well, you know, I know I used the word the other day, and it's a word I don't think I've ever used an article before in my life, but I wanted to say a war chest, because quite frankly, I've, you've never heard Tottenham having a transfer war chest, really. And finally, it feels like they've got that financial might. And I just think the timing of it all, you know, to come out with that, I don't think they had to be that public with the statement. I think they had to, I think they had to announce it somewhere, but it didn't have to be that big a deal. And I think the fact that they did it was very much, uh, it was knocking the ball back into Conte's side of the court. It's saying, look, there you go. We're going to do everything you want. Let's go for it kind of thing. And uh, yeah, I mean, 
this meeting, you know, this meeting to come, it's it's sounding like a very different meeting now from everything I'm hearing. You know, Daniel Levy from I'm Sad isn't even going. It's going to be Paratici and Conte discussing transfer targets. It's it's no longer seems to be a here's the future of Antonio Conte. What happens? It's a okay. Conte's happy. Let's crack on now. Let's work out who we're getting exactly and which ones we're going to finalise bids for. Which is so exciting. And that is why my videos. I think my voice is probably getting a higher pitch than more. It sounds like I'm kind of doing them at double speed. I think because it is really exciting. It's it's higher only than when I said. Well, it, it, well, mine's it was still high. It was, oh, mine was still higher when I sang the Ben Davies songs. Don't worry, yeah, it was when I done the Champions League theme tune the other day. <laughs> that was seriously high. You know what? It was the moment I did it. I did it and I said, "Oh my god, you actually just did the Champions League anthem." And I was like, "I don't care." I was so excited about everything that's happened. Really? The fact that we're going to be back in that competition. That competition has given some Spurs some of the biggest nights in recent yeah. history. You know, wow, wow, wow. Wow. we're back yeah. in there. Um, yeah. It was funny actually. I was having a kind of a chat with I think it was, it was actually my neighbour um, who was saying that um, you know he, he was asking about all of that and, and the Champions League stuff. And I was actually thinking, in a way, it's a, in a weird parallel universe. If Spurs really wanted to kind of challenge title wise, the Champions League is almost a bit of a distraction, but yet it's still wonderful. You know, it's like yeah. we saw what Conte did with Chelsea the year that Spurs challenged them. Chelsea had no European football that year, and he absolutely, you know, he was fantastic with, with Chelsea. So it's a funny thing. Spurs have got to balance it. They've really got to manage next season really carefully. And that's why what Paratici does with the squad, you know, he's looking to assemble a squad that can compete on all fronts. And that should be exciting for us. It is. But it's also, he's got to get it absolutely right. Otherwise, they could end up mucking up in all of them. But fingers crossed, that's not going to be the case. And it's all about the level of that quality. They've got to be able to look at that bench, Conte, and say, there you go, there's a similar standard player. I'm going to bring him on. We can change this game. Because let's be honest, he hasn't been able to do that this season. Yeah, no, that's absolutely fair. Now, I know the boys are probably keen to ask you a couple of questions on this as well. Um, just because we're nearly half hour and we've not touched on the season review yet. So, and there's <laughs> one question from me and then we'll feed it to the boys. Um, I mean, we've had a... So, Dustin, Dustin Debo, 1980, says, always love this collaboration. Thanks so much, uh, Dustin. Um, he says, Alistair, do you feel the timing of the team statement about the investment was done intentionally to ensure that Conte will commit to the club moving forward? Now, we know, Ali, of course, that I think there's, and you know this probably better than me, were there seven or eight months more to run uh, on Conte's contracts? Well, he signed a year. So, remind me, he signed a year and was it 18, an 18 month contract, wasn't it? It's got the season. Yeah, yeah, he's got yeah. the next season to come. Yeah. So I'm just wondering, obviously, based on this cash injection, I mean, are we are we expecting Conte to be offered a new contract before the start of the season? It just feels a, I feel a little bit uneasy going into the start of a new season with such a short contract still to run. How do you feel about that? It's interesting because obviously they've got an option as well. There's an option, I think, we think both sides have to agree with it, but they can then extend it for another season after that if they do. Um, it, it's it's a really interesting one. I mean, Conte is one of the best paid managers in the world with this job at Tottenham. So it's not like the guy is like, you know, He's just mucking in, helping out and all that sort of stuff. He is getting very, very well paid. So, I mean, we'll have to see. We'll have to see whether he wants that as a show of being backed. I don't know. Or whether the actual player side of it. I mean, he's not a guy that normally is a long contract guy anyway, I don't think. I mean, we've seen his past. He's he's not someone that's stuck around for too long. Um, Just hopefully, and this is something I've been saying, I think, in recent videos. I hope for him this feels different. This feels like a different kind of era for Conte. He's being, essentially, they're giving him the keys to the castle in a way. They're saying to him, you decide what comes next, you know? And that, I don't think he's probably had another, you know, with no disrespect to Spurs, probably bigger clubs, or clubs certainly with more silverware in recent history, their recent history. So yeah. he can actually come in now, not just be a, a cog in a wheel, but he can actually be the guy kind of turning all those wheels um, and deciding where they go. So... Yeah, I, I do understand about the whole time of the announcement thing. Like I say, I think I think they didn't have to be quite as big as it was, but it's done the trick, isn't it? It's got it's got all of us kind of yeah. buzzing. It, Conte, from what I understand, is happy. They, they Spurs seem to be happy that he's happy, um, and now they crack on and uh, as time for a new contract. We'll we'll see, we'll see. I think if he's truly happy and they offer it, um, then why not? It does give everyone that little bit more of a. I suppose, a solid foundation. But what I would say is he's walked out in the past when there's been a contract. So I don't think that's the be-all and end-all. 
Okay, interesting. Ali, final couple of que- listener questions. I'll let the boys quickly ask you, then we'll go for the first break of the show for our listeners on audio. Um, Ali, so we've got uh, CJ Wardy asking the question, could we have kept this internal? Does it give a hindrance? Well, is it a hindrance to us that we've gone public with the cash injection? And uh, Gabriel PH asked the question, um, in terms of massive investment, how much will that will that match up to what United City and even Newcastle do? Probably hard to answer that one, but also just, just interested to get your thoughts really on the fact that did the club need to go public in your opinion? I think so, yeah. I think I think I think I think purely for the PR value of it. I think it's given everyone such a lift. And like I say, it's if you're gonna be slightly cynical, if Conte, let's say, were to throw a tantrum, because he is a man who likes his emotion. I, I've seen it firsthand. Um and if he were to do that and decided he wanted to walk out, I think it becomes a little bit more peculiar. I think let's say, well, even a week ago, I think maybe people would have said, okay, all right, well, what have Spurs done? They've messed this one up, blah, blah, blah. But now, the fact that it is all in place, if Conte doesn't want to take everything he's now been given, then I think more questions end up then being asked about him, and I think people look at it as a, he becomes a guy that serially walks out on clubs. I think that would be the narrative that would be formed around it. Whereas this way... It's yeah, I think it's quite clever from a PR point of view and a tactical move as well. Um, and yeah, in terms of the kind of the finances, the others, I think look, we know United are going to throw a bit of money at their problems. I don't think they've shown that money solved their problems. I mean, Conte made a great point. You know, they finished second last season, and then they brought in what Baran, Ronaldo, Sancho, and you know, they dropped off the face of the earth essentially in terms of challenging for a title. So I don't think money fixed them in any way. And I'm intrigued to see where kind of Ten Hag fits in. It's a very different job to Ajax. If anything, in a weird way, I think Spurs was the better next move for him back in the, you know, last summer. Whereas actually, I think United, that's a huge step with a lot of egos. And I don't know where the money is going to be the answer there. Newcastle, I think we've seen with other clubs that have had a lot of money it's a slower process than they probably hope it's going to be. Um, so I wouldn't imagine chucking money at that. And don't get me wrong, they've done very well in the second half of the season. Eddie Howe, I think, has probably restored a lot of his reputation as well, as, well as one of the good young yeah. kind of managers in the game. But no, I think Spurs, exactly like they did in the league, concentrate on themselves. Concentrate on themselves and uh, with Conte at the helm. Paratici working with Conte, we mustn't kind of overlook how well each other, they know each other, those two. And Con- uh, Paratici knows what Conte needs. And also, he's now had a year of knowing what the Premier League requires as well. Because that was something that Conte had a bit of a, a dig at him as well, about the transfers from the summer. Maybe not all of them were Premier League ready. And we saw what happened in January. You know, two of the best suited Premier League signings I think I've maybe ever seen. The, the quickest adaptions I've ever seen of two foreign players. Um, so if we get more of that this summer, God, who knows what can happen. Yeah, I mean, guys, very more quickly, you, Lee, you, more you, you come in there. I think, I think John, John, did you want to come and ask a question? I think it's in the offer about Ali about. Yeah, very good. absolutely. I just want to put a oh, devil's advocate on a question here that may not be popular with the Tottenham fans at the moment and that kind of thing. Is there any scenario whereby? They, Tottenham know, or Levy and Enoch know, that Conte's family are in Italy. Maybe he doesn't want to come back. Maybe they put this announcement out there. And I'm just playing devil's advocate, guys. I'm not saying this is happening. I'm not hoping this is happening or anything like that. I just wanted to, I'm surprised he's not been made more of. And I just wanted to ask the question myself. Um, whereby they know he's not coming back, but they put this announcement out there. And it shows that they have done absolutely everything to back him. And then it's down to him not coming back and it's not on them. And Tottenham fans can't then turn around and say, oh, you didn't do everything to keep this guy. You know, he got us in the top four. And actually, they know all along that look, his family are in Italy and not coming over anytime soon. And maybe he wants to go back to Italy. Yeah, it's an interesting one. Um, I, I get, Yeah, I get where you're coming from. Like I say, I do think there is a tactical side to the statement. I do. I think with Conte and the whole family in Italy thing, I mean, there is on, an obvious reason. It's not that he's not committing to be over here. His, his young daughter, Victoria, is still in school over in Italy. So it's a case of her finishing her school. I think she's only something like 15 or 16. She's quite young. So that's why they're over there. And he literally flies over there as much as possible. Um, and he's obviously there right now, uh, which is why they're going to have her attitude. She's actually going to fly over there, which is why they're having the meeting in Italy. Um I get it. I get what you're saying. Um, it does throw the, the pressure on him. 
But then obviously, if he were to go, whoever comes in, whether that be Graham Potter, whether that be Mauricio Pochettino, whoever, um, that money still has to be there for them. So, Nuno, you know, Nuno it's, coming it's, back, Hayley. I know. <laughs> I'm just looking at the, the comments no, coming. Yeah, just, say- just, a comment of, just a comment on that as well. I mean, Sun's gone back to South Korea. I mean, they've all had a couple of days off. So, I, I really, I, I don't think there's anything to read into, in my opinion. Surely not. I, no. I get what John means, though. I do get what John means. I do. I do. I, I, there, there is, I think some Spurs fans have always had that fear that is he fully committed <laughs> to the London life? I, I get it. Oh dear. Oh, t- I love it. Now people with it. This is why we're Spurs fans. We always are looking <laughs> for the most worst possible reason. Um, JB Lee, before we go for a break, anyone ask any question on the cash injection? Anything, boys? I just I just wanted to quickly make a statement. You mentioned earlier about United uh, in, uh, spending loads of money and not necessarily getting didn't really work for Arsenal either, did it? <laughs> they, they won the they won the summer transfer window of 142 million and they came fifth. <laughs> nice one, boys. I love it. Fantastic. Well, what we will do is uh, we will go for our first break of the show for our listeners that are on audio. Taking this break, you're going to hear from Dane Scarlett, who's just penned a new contract with Spurs. They will maybe get Ali sorts out later on, depending on the length of this show. Uh, for our watching audience on YouTube, there's nearly 1,500 of you plus watching us live on a Europa Conference League final night. You know where you want to be. And I think the uh, numbers speak that. So thank you so much for all of your incredible support. We're joined by the brilliant Ali Gold. And, and, and alongside Ali, we've got John Wenham, Jamie Brown, Lee McQueen. Oh, what a show. What a show. Right. Okay, I'm going to hand over to Lee to steer us to the season review that we've been trying to start for the last hour. Lee, over to you. So I was on mute. Um, so, so we're going to the season review, yeah? We're getting back on track, right, to the season <laughs> review. Okay, fantastic. Um, this is really good. Um, okay, so look, let's 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 think back to uh, to that summer. Um, we spent what uh, the whole of the summer chasing managers. Uh, we ended up appointing Nuno Spiritu Santo. Um, he was going to make us proud. I think everybody remembers that. It was definitely going to make us proud. Um, but the results towards the the you know the end of his reign were just utterly woeful. I mean. I think that we were. I think did we lose four London derbies, or three, certainly three London derbies, didn't we? We scored Chelsea, they, uh, it was Palace Arsenal. and Chelsea and Arsenal. Four. All of them scored yeah. three uh, against us respectively, and then of course we lost to Manchester United three nil. Um, it was absolutely awful. Um, what 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 was your, the seventy two day managerial search? What what was your kind of what was your thinking, Ali, on on that? I mean, it was a bit of a farce, wasn't it? Just a tad, just a little bit. God, I can't remember how I was. It was a nightmare. It was it's just the it. most ridiculous thing I've ever seen a professional company do. It was so bad. They had one shortlist of things that they were working their way through. Daniel Levy made the big statement in his chairman's message at the end of the season. You know, someone that's going to bring us attacking, free flowing, entertainment yeah. football. And they did all of that. They had this short list of names. They had some really interesting people on it. It had Poch on it. Uh, it had Ten Hag. It had Potter. It had people that played that kind of football. Um, and <laughs> for actually, essentially, they kind of, I think it was when they realised they couldn't get Poch. I think they decided, OK, all right, we'll definitely go with the, the whole Pratichy side, you know, for the future. Let's sort that out. Bring him in. And they didn't even take into account that he might come in and go, yeah, nice list, lads. No, you're right. And then just went off in his own tangent with completely different names, completely different types of managers. And there we are, all of those days later, Nuno Espresso Santo. And I feel so sorry for him. I do, because he is genuinely a lovely guy. He was so nice, despite the fact that he felt like he had to tell me off every single week. That's absolutely fine. <laughs> I was going to say, he always told you off. He did, he did. But he was so nice and he meant well. And I think he genuinely did believe that he could be the right man for Tottenham. But he just wasn't. Just every stat about the team was like in the bottom half of everything, real or even bottom at times. And he just wasn't ever going to be the man to play that football that Levy said. And I remember at the time, I, I know, Paratic, he had to convince Levy that he was the right man. I remember Pratici actually showed him videos of Nuno's old Valencia team just to convince him, oh, no, no, he can play attacking football, don't worry. And I got the impression he even came in and, and clearly someone along the way had said, don't play with a back five. 
whatever you do, don't blow a back five. They'll, they'll think you're a really defensive manager. And what happens? The guy that replaced him plays with a back three and essentially a back five. And everyone's raving about it. And it's like, I do wonder, there's a part of me that if he'd been able to play the way that Nuno actually wanted to play, could he have had a little bit more success? I don't know. But let's be honest, we wouldn't be where we are now. So, Although we might have had a night in Tirana. Who knows? <laughs> John, <laughs> John, over to you. Obviously, Nuno navigated us during that pre-season. We had the likes of Romero come in, Golini, um, Gil, uh, amongst others that, that did come in. And, you know, did you feel like, obviously, with the start we had with Nuno, the pre-season was good. We had the win at Arsenal. We had a win against Arsenal, sorry, the draw at Chelsea. And we have won our first three games, including that game against Man City that shouldn't be forgotten about, actually. The atmosphere that day was amazing. We had the whole Harry Kane drama going on. Uh, we had Jaffet Tanganga dropping 11 out of 10 performances as we defeated Manchester City. And it was a real, I mean, the atmosphere, we were so together as fans, actually, on that day. And, that, and those three games, you know, Nuno did get three 1-0 wins, um, you know, three clean sheets, nine points on the board, nominated or what and won uh, my first manager of the month of the season. Do you oh, feel yeah. though he could have done... Do you feel, yeah, I mean, how mad is that? And do you feel, though, he, he, could, he could have done more, Alistair, with, with guys like yourself and other journalists to make you feel kind of a, a bigger connection with him, whereas maybe you had that with Poch, maybe you had that with Mason and maybe even Mourinho. Maybe, maybe. And maybe that was just the biggest curse of the manager of the month ever. <laughs> maybe that was just like... And, uh, was you know what? The big, yeah, the biggest praise that I can give to Nuno was how well he did that summer. Because he had chaos behind the scenes with everything yeah. going on with Kane, uh, with Tongi. Tongi was having some problems that summer as well. And, and you know, he, he, to be fair to him, he kind of created this bubble around the team and he concentrated kind of on getting them fit, which was ironic because actually by the end they weren't actually that fit. But in that summer, he did really work on that. Um, so, yeah, that first month, I think he does. I think he absolutely deserves that award, although it ends up kind of absolutely being the, uh, the curse. In terms of the journos, he just doesn't care. He just doesn't. We, we were kind of joking. You might have seen us on Twitter. We were having a little laugh yesterday, some of the Spurs journos, about had the, in a parallel universe whether we were actually at the final in Tirana. And he was. He just didn't care. We, we, you know, Conte is very happy to talk to the media, although I don't think he likes going over a set, a set amount of time. But um, with, with Nuno... He just wanted to get out there as quickly as possible. But ironically, anyone that's... Um, we never got to that stage, but journos that covered him at Wolves, they said that if you got him away from the cameras and had a sit-down, he'd talk for hours and he'd be the most engaging, entertaining, tactical brain. He'd talk through things. And we were getting, no, or all of the players are important, Alistair, and stuff like that. I was like, oh, God, I just want you to praise on the skip. I was like, honest sort of stuff. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, he, he just, of course he could have done more. And I think, unfortunately, the one most probably awkward moment where they tried to get him to engage, which is now well known, you know, I'm going to make you proud, which was probably the most forced thing now in hindsight ever, um, because it really wasn't the way he spoke at all. And unfortunately, it just sounds like that was the way he ended up being on the training ground as well, which is everything I heard was that, the way he was with us, not particularly inspiring. And that was how the players felt. And, and fortunately, you couldn't have more of a polar opposite with Conte because he is so different. Uh, mm. But yeah, yeah, just unfortunate for Nuno. Wrong man, wrong time, wrong club. Absolutely. It's, it's almost like a challenger for a world title fight on the boxing ring, wouldn't it? That you know for a fact is going to get absolutely battered by the heavyweight champion. But you've got to go in the ring and, and you just know they don't want to be there, but they're going in there because they're going to get paid. To, you know I mean, it had that feel about it. Authenticity is so important in, in everything, in life, sport, in, in it, whatever you do. And he just, in that job, he just wasn't his authentic self at all from start to finish. I, I t it was just a nightmare. Yeah, absolutely. Jay, let's come over to you. Yeah, I mean, it, it's just crazy thinking of uh, how well we started, actually, because I remember we obviously won those first three games. I remember even doing a silly tweet in, in terms of showing that Spurs were top of the league, Arsenal were bottom of the league. He, of course, won manager of the month. Um, and it all looked like it was going pretty well. But ultimately, kind of that manager of the month, those win, those three wins, they kind of really masked, you know, what the, the real problems that were going on because of them. We suffered some bad defeats. We, of course, lost to Chelsea. We lost to Arsenal. Uh, we lost to Palace as well, that big 3-0 defeat. Um, and of course, in the end, he was only in charge for 17 matches. Do, do you think there's kind of any, anything else he could have done? 
um, to maybe have had a bit more time in that job? Or was this kind of always destined to fail, Spurs and Nuno? Sadly, I think it was. I think it was destined. I mean, like I say, if he couldn't inspire the players on the training ground, it's not going to happen, is it? It's not. They weren't. And to be fair to him, he was kind of on a losing wicket from the start because when you've sacked Mourinho, who, whatever you think about him, has been one of the most successful managers in the game. Um, and there's all this talk about ambition still and, and all of that. And then you bring in a guy who he knew and everyone knew. He was like, on the original list of managers, he wasn't even on it. And then on the second short list under Paratici, he wasn't even, I don't think, in the top five on that. And it's just he was coming in with the players knowing that, the media knowing that, and the fans knew it. You know, the one thing that he did do, and I remember this quite clearly, he made a real attempt to come over to all the fans before games. He would walk along them before the matches started, after the game. He would spend ages doing interviews, autographs, and selfies. And this was, you know, this was obviously quite post-COVID. And I think all the first half were like, going to get away from it. <laughs> but actually, to be fair, he tried on the day to do that. And I always remember this kind of moment that sticks with me with Nuno, which is why I never really feel I can be too kind of hard on him. Because after the Man City game, uh, which obviously was, was a cracking win at the time, but we were all so, like, surprised and delighted with it. He, way after the final whistle, Everyone else had left, and I was still typing something out up in the uh, in the press box. And I just watched him walk along with his family, and they walked along the pitch all on their own because the exit obviously was in the far corner. And they did a little selfie together, and it was all like they're just sharing this really kind of emotional moment where he'd come to this big club, everyone thought he was out of his depth, and he'd beaten Man City in his first game. And I just think for me, there's just that little emotional side to it. I saw how, how much it meant for him and his family. And it's just such a shame it didn't work out for him. But like you say, I don't think it ever destined, was ever destined to. Mm-hmm. That, and after Ali, go on, Lee, sorry. Just quickly, that, that for me also, I don't want to sound rude to, to, to Nuno at all. I don't mean it disrespectfully, but just that moment itself showed that he wasn't ready for that job because, you know, you just. It, it, you have these wonderful moments. Like you see Conte winning against City at the Etihad and you have these wonderful moments, but it didn't feel that that same thing as what you witnessed with Nuno. Do you know what I mean? Even, I was obviously wasn't there witnessing that moment, but I, I remember after the game, he was coming up to the camera as if he'd just won like the league or something. And you could just tell that it wasn't, it wasn't, it, he wasn't big enough for that job. I mean, it was a big job as well. Don't get me wrong. I don't want to be rude to, to anybody. Who wanted? I think somebody said in the comments, "Who wanted that job, Ali?" To be fair, because at, at that time, that, that's oh, why we few managers turned them down. Quite a no few one managers. wanted it, did they? It was like a poison yeah. chalice almost. Yeah, it's true. Oh, I tell you, um, this is not to this is not to finish Nuno off now after what Lee just said, but uh, you know, Spurs failed to have a shot on target in a home Premier League game for the first time since the final defeat to Liverpool in December 2013 on the back of that United result. Um, and at the time, it was two hours and 16 minutes of Premier League action since Spurs had a shot on target when Harry Kane had a head of, head of saved in the first half of East West Ham. And uh, of course, Nuno was also the first Spurs manager since Christian Gross. You remember those days. Some of you do remember these days. The youngest is mine, remember, but we we do remember those days. We will see the ticket, the, the one way ticket to lose five is only in ten matches under the boss, under under the pre, under the previous uh, tenship, yeah. of course, under the boss, as I call him. <laughs> enter, enter, and Sadio Conte. And I hand back over to Lee McQueen. Or do Sorry, I? I got myself on mute again. Yeah, no, absolutely. And yeah, of course, under the boss, old Christian Gross. Spurs wasted no time, of course, in welcoming the Don Antonio Conte back to the Mandarin game at a time where, you know, let's be honest, we were languishing, what, ninth place, I think it was, in the Premier League. Um, just going to read out uh, one of the statements. I think Rick's got this printed on his pyjamas uh, at home. Uh, well, I'm sure we'll get them I out have- at some point. But Antonio Conte said, I'm extremely happy to return to coaching and to do so at a Premier League club that has the ambition uh, to be the protagonist again, said Conte. The accomplished title winner would end uh, up becoming the first Spurs manager in history to go unbeaten in his first nine Premier League games. I totally forgot that before researching this out. I completely forgot that he was undefeated, wasn't he, for his first nine Premier League games. Uh, Conte kick-started his Spurs tenure with a point away to Everton, followed by three straight home wins over Leeds, Brentford, and then, of course, Norwich City. Lucas firing that, for, uh, that first goal in um, at Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. 
Then we've got a really good 2-2 draw, I think, versus Liverpool. Um, that extended Conte's unbeaten league start uh, to five games. Uh, and though uh, we, we then started to come up into his seventh game uh, and then his eighth game, Harry Kane ends a gold route. Um, I think I think you mentioned right at the top of the show, Ali, that I don't, I don't think Harry Kane had scored. I think he'd scored one, maybe. I might be wrong here. Yeah, one Newcastle away, right, wasn't it? Yeah, Newcastle away. Yeah, right at the yeah um, incredible to think that until in, in November. Um, so Harry Kane ends his gold route with a fine finish in the 13th minute. December ended with Conte still unbeaten in the Premier League with a win over Crystal Palace. I think they went down to 10 men from memory and a draw away to Southampton, who also went down to 10 men. We referenced that at the beginning of the show. Uh, we kicked off 2022 with a last gasp, Davinson Sanchez power header. Come on, Dav, uh, against Watford on New Year's Day. Um, Ali, quick question to you. Was you surprised at Conte's strong start domestically? Um, or was that purely down to, I don't know, like the new manager bounce and, 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 and what it can bring when you change a manager at such a time? Um, I think it's. I think it purely it's down to that polar opposite thing. Is the fact that they've had such a uh, so so horrible to say, but such a dour personality in charge, and to have someone who is such a ball of energy. That was what they said. Every, everyone at the time, even in the corridors of Hotspur Way, he was just like a just this crazy kind of force walking around, and and just it changed the whole mood of the place. And that's all you need. It's that little switch. And and people like Harry Kane. Let's be honest. With everything else that had gone on, he didn't get that move in the summer. He was not being inspired by Nuno Espirito Santo. Of course he's not, you know. And then Antonio Conte comes in, one of the best managers in the world, and instantly everyone wants to put their body on the line for him. Everything changes. Fitness was a massive thing in those early weeks as well. He, he would tell us about that. He'd say, you know, essentially this is my pre-season. It's trying to get them all fit enough for what I want them to do. Because don't forget, those early weeks... They were shattered by the end of each match because right, he was yeah. trying to get them pressing. He was trying to get them pressing in every area possible. And he was saying to them, look, we can only do it for an hour or so. That, that's all and they can do it for. The stats, Ali, as well. Do you remember? We were bot bottom of everything yeah. when he first came. I forgot. 20th in the league for running, 20th in the league for pressing, 20th in the league for you know shots on target or whatever. I mean, it was woeful, wasn't it? Absolutely woeful. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was. And, and that was his key thing. He, he first off was... You know, he's got Gian Petro, um, Petro Vitroni, uh, Pietro Vitroni, uh, his fitness coach, like a legendary in Italy for absolutely kind of just turning players into machines, quite frankly. And that's what he's done at Tottenham as well. I mean, Harry Kane says now, without any hesitation, he's the fittest he's ever been in his career. And what is he, 28 now? And you think about the Poch, Poch used to give him double sessions every day. Oh, yeah. yeah, and he is fitter than he was then. And it's, I don't know if it's any coincidence. Of course, there were unfortunate injuries, but he hasn't had an injury this season. I do wonder whether there's any little little thing that's just helped him. I don't know. But yeah, I think that was it. Fitness and confidence, I think, changed everything those early months. Um, and then, yeah, obviously, it's, uh, it kind of started to go a little bit awry, didn't it? Probably the Chelsea game started to turn it slightly. Yeah, I mean, John, let's uh, steer the show round to you. Yeah, unfortunately, it's another negative one from me, and it's that 2-1 Conference League defeat at Mora. Um, you know, where, and ultimately, we're then forced to, to leave the Europa League owing to the COVID-19 outbreak at the club later on. For you, Ali, just how low was Conte after that defeat for Mora? And did you already get the feeling then that maybe he didn't have all the players following his directions as best as they could have been at that point? You know what? That night at Mora was one of the worst matches I've ever covered but one of the best press conferences I've ever covered. Because we, as as media, hadn't been allowed into press conferences at that point for a while. We were still doing them over Zoom because of COVID and everything. That night, um, due to rules in, in, in Slovenia, you know, we were allowed to, to be there and, and, and just to actually be face-to-face -face with Conte, finally. And he was so honest and he was so brutal about everything. Um, and for us as journalists, it was like, oh, my God, this is incredible. It's just like he's laying bare everything that is wrong with Tottenham right now. Um, do you know what? I think he's had two kind of nights where he's done that. One was obviously Burra, and the other, I'm sure we'll talk about in a bit, was Burnley. And I think both times they've been important parts of the process to where Tottenham are now. Um, 
Yeah, I, I think he says it himself. He's an emotional guy. He likes to use the carrot and the stick. Sometimes he'll whack him with a stick a bit too much. Sometimes he'll give him the carrot too much. Um, I don't know if you saw in that video um, of his last day speech when he starts to talk about it and he goes something about just two things and you hear Sonny shout out, two days off. Yeah. And apparently that's because that was one of his carrot things. Whenever they won, he'd give them two days off. Um, and so clearly it took him a few months, I'd say, to probably learn what players needed, what kind of motivation and what's to do with the whole group and stuff like that. And I find that all fascinating, that side of man management of the game. Uh, so, yeah, I think it, it was tough words, but I think ultimately it's it's got us to where we are now. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, so of course we were knocked out of that competition in, in pretty weird circumstances. I think with that game against Stad Brenz being called off, we of course didn't have enough points to, to qualify. Um, how important do you think that was that we were, we got um, eliminated from that competition? Because that, of course, allowed us to play almost one game a week, really. Um, of course, Arsenal were doing the same as well, so they almost had that advantage for for most of the season in terms of being able to play one, once a week. So how important do you think that was for, for Spurs to be able to be, be eliminated from that competition? Yeah, it's weird, isn't it? It was huge. It was it was absolutely huge. You kind of, at the time, you had that split in people that were like, it's a trophy, Spurs need a trophy. But actually, I don't think they would have finished fourth. I don't think, especially when you see how thin the squad was in these last yeah. few weeks. Yeah. Um, I don't think they would have been able to do it. And, and I even said earlier, that's my worry about next season is actually Conte managing two matches a week or three matches a week, technically. Because, and this is, you know, I'm going to play John's role of being the, the you know, the downcast one here, is that with Conte, if you're going to have one criticism of his managerial career, it's been his European uh, stuff. You know, the Champions League, he's only won three of his last 15 matches. So if you were going to be really critical of him, you'd say, can he juggle you know, the, all these different games in a week. I mean, he might point to the fact that, well, you know, we've come back after European games and we won the, whatever it was, Premier League or Serie A or whatever uh, games. But yeah, I don't think there can be any kind of bones about it that not having that extra match in midweek and the travelling and everything meant that he could spend loads of time on Hotspur away pitches. Um, I don't think it's any coincidence that when Spurs had five, six days off before a game, they invariably won those matches. And that is because the players have told us this enough, the details that man goes into before a game, that every player down to the exact kind of nanosecond of a game knows exactly where they're meant to be, what they're meant to do with set pieces, where they're meant to be when player A gets the ball, every other one of the 10 players knows where they're meant to be positioned. And I think having five, six days at least or seven to drill that in is huge. And then that conference league, you know, which was essentially, let's be honest, it was like a Europa League knockoff. It even had the same song. Um, although, you know, I, I got to see the delights. I got to see uh, to be the only English journalist interviewing Nuno out in Pesos de Ferreira. And we had the delights of Mura. We, we um, thought that was a knockoff, Ali. We thought it was a knockoff of the actual uh, Paco Rabanne for a second when that came out that. that, that, uh, that, that. I'll tell you. I'll tell you. And, and uh, we have a little, because Mura had this, a brilliant song that they played before the match, which all the journos still laugh about. It, it's just Charlie Eccleshare from the Athletic does a brilliant version of it. If you you know you ever get him on, get him to sing the Bura song because it, okay. it's, it's superb. Uh, essentially, that's why I'm saying that is because that was the most memorable thing about the Europa Conference League was the Bura <laughs> Stadium song, and that pretty much says it all. Uh, it was uh, no real use to Tottenham whatsoever, um, and. Yeah, we saw exactly what happened as soon as they got out of it. We did well, indeed. Breaking news on that, by the way, on the uh, Europa Conference League, uh, Jose is 20 minutes away from picking up yet another piece of silverware in his long, long list of silverware. Look at Jay <laughs> Brown's face. <laughs> the only club ever for him not to pick up a trophy, if it carries on the way it is, would be Tottenham Hotspur. I mean, you could not make this stuff up, could you? You definitely Lads, can make it up. You definitely can make it up. <laughs> Oh, no, mate. I must just say, for uh, listeners, don't fear. Uh, John has got some nice moments coming up in the season review. It's not all been pl <laughs> not all been negative for John. There are some nice ones coming up. We are going to have to reject the script at this rate, though. Um, Ali, I think what we look back now is probably being one of the most crucial wins of this season. Stephen Bergvine, the two injury time goals at the death as Spurs fought back from two one down to snatch an incredible victory up at the King Power and a thrilling finish. There were scenes in the away end, as Conte still kept that unbeaten run going in the Premier League at the time. Just how crazy, Ali, was that night up at the King Power? Uh, 
it was like a, a mini Ajax, a mini Amsterdam. It really was. It was just ridiculous. And I think there were so many kind of narratives to it as well. I think the whole Bergwijn narrative was lovely as well because he is a guy that has got talent. He's a guy that's just had these almost sliding door moments in his first career, like chances against Liverpool, little things like that. If you put the ball in the net, I just wonder where his trajectory could have gone. He might have even been the Kulusevski now. It might be Steven Bergwijn in that kind of confident role. Um, and that night was just, it was such, a, it was just brilliant. I thought Kane was fantastic that night as well. And, and just, what a game. And, and I think if anything showed the new spirit under Conte, I think it was that night, um, that, that King Power Stadium. It was just those last few minutes. It was like tumbleweed. All the Leicester fans were just so quiet and all you could hear with your away support. And just for them to be able to celebrate in front of there, the goals to be right in front of there as well, it was just incredible. Um, and I think, I, I, I seriously think, I think that night Conte saw something different in his players. I think he saw that there was that bit of steel, there was that spirit, and it was almost like, yeah, you yeah, know, I, I think I can, I think I can, there's something here I can work with. Obviously, we know Turf Moor was to come, um, but there was something that night I think told him there's something there that he could start to mould and uh, oh, it was a brilliant night. It was so good. One, the one thing that really struck me from that game was the way that I think it was when they got the equaliser, I think it was Bergwijn and Kane run to, run, run to get the ball back straight away and yeah. it was just kind of like yeah. any other team might have gone crazy that they'd scored a 95th minute equaliser but you know they were desperate to go and get that winner and they just really believed that they could go and do I mean we even saw that with Arsenal when they got that late equaliser against uh, Palace back in uh, back earlier in the season, you know they got that late point and they were you know celebrating with their fans, but it was quite the opposite from Spurs. You know, desperate to go and get that winner, and that that was something that that, that really struck me from that game. Yes, and the way Did that you... ball, just going to say, the way that ball rolled over the line, the final goal. Honestly, I've watched it back so many times, and there's so many moments. It was like the only angle that that ball could have missed all the players kind of dissecting across it. It was just incredible. Yeah. The, co the, the commentary, uh, Rob from uh, from Spurs TV, does brilliant commentary, obviously, for Spurs yeah. TV. And he was just, it was like, is he going? Like, is it like, what, is he Dutchman. going? Like, he's commentary Flying with Dutchman. it. And I, actually, I just pulled the stats up out of the blue book. Blue book is here tonight, of course. Um, and uh, we had 51% possession that night, that day. We had 10 shots on target. I think it was the best we've ever we played under Antonio Conte, that Leicester game. We thoroughly deserved to win that match. They only had four shots on target, Leicester. And I can't, I couldn't believe that we were 2 1 down in that game with like a few minutes to go, like in injury time, because we, we battered them that day. We had loads of passes, brilliant, uh, brilliant shot. We had 27 attempts that day on target, yeah. uh, like at goal and, and 10 on target. M amazing football match. Yeah, yeah. Agree. Think, wasn't it the night that kind of Matt Doherty started his renaissance as well? He just yeah. saw signs yeah. of it when he yeah. came on. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He, did. he kind of bundled one across, didn't he, for the <laughs> yeah. one first, first, like a bundled assist or something, wouldn't it? Yeah, it all counts. Just before yeah, we bring Lee back in, are you only right to ask us about Bergwijn? I think you mentioned it on your YouTube channel the other day. Um, is he one, I think you put it out there, you maybe expect him to move on given his lack of game time? Is it a shame, do you think, Ali? Third fine? Sadly, I think so. I think so. I mean, he, he wants to play. It's a World Cup year. He, he obviously helped Netherlands get to the World Cup. He wants to be playing regularly. And Conte really likes him. But the problem is, he says he really likes him. And he always praises him, says he offers something that no one else does in the squad. And then he'll bring Lucas Moura on in front of him every single game. Um, so he knows it's just going to be a bit part thing here and there. And I think... <laughs> The one thing for Spurs' point of view is Bergwijn is a valuable asset in terms of the fee that it can get. Ajax desperately want him. And, you know, Spurs would turn him down bids of over 20 million. So I think the summer comes. And I think, you know, that's another bit of money that they get to put towards their war chest. So oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. we had it. Where you go. The name drop, the big one. War chest. war chest. On the back of that, we will go for our next break of the show for our listeners and audio. For our watching audience, still there's over 1,500 of you plus watching us live. Thank you so much for all of your incredible support for last one on Spurs. Listen, we've had got the brilliant John Wyndham, Jamie Brown, Lee McQueen, and Ali Gold in the house going gold tonight. I tell you, it's been a great show so far. We're going to steer the show back round to Lee McQueen to. I think he's taking Jamie's section. We're talking about the January window. How the cheek of it, Lee, over to you. I can't believe I've got the January section. Unbelievable. Quick uh, shout out to Mike and George. I know they're watching tonight. Nice one, boys. And a uh, big shout out to Jordan, who works with Ant, one of our own, Anthony Costa, 
Uh, keep listening, bro. Jordan, big show, a, fan, um, a big fan of the show. Um, so a uh, big shout out to, to, to all of you guys. Um, and uh, everyone else is supporting us, of course, all, all of the time. So back over to Conte. And he demanded in January the transfer window action from Tottenham. And I think all of us were a little bit worried at that point. Um, but he was definitely rewarded handsomely. I think it was in the dying, dying in minutes or the hours, as John mentioned earlier. Um, out of the door went Tunga Ndombele, Giovanni Lo Celso, Brian Hill, um, all out on loans uh, to Leon Villarreal and uh, Valencia, respectively. Meanwhile, Spurs obviously left it late because I think Paratigi and Conte were still trying to get their feet under the table and Daniel Levy was still doing kind of late deals. But they left it late, but they brought in the wonderful. He's the reason, of course. He is the reason. Rodrigo Bentinker, who provided much needed energy uh, to help control that central midfield. And of course, the signing of Swedish star Dejan Kulisevsky, uh, Deki, as he's known to all of his uh, people. And it's a gimme, gimme for him. It was, it was a, an absolute gimme. His stats have been superb. Looking back now, um, Ali, how crucial was that January transfer window in terms of both, not just the incomings, as, as you touched upon, but the outgoings as well? Because I think they've been absolutely perfect to get them out of the club um, at, at the same time as bringing them other two people in. Yeah, you know, I, th I think I said it on something the other day. I, I think it was with Guesty on our podcast. I think I said, I think there were two days when Spurs secured top four. I think one was that night at Turf Moor, and I think the other was January 31st in the transfer window. Because what they did that day was, I think Conte said it himself, it, he built, even though they weakened numerically his squad, he built a more complete squad. It was a, it had a different feel to it. It's like, None of those players, let's say, they weren't troublemakers or anything like that that went out the door. Obviously, Delhi as well. None of them were troublemakers, but what they were, they were dissatisfied players who weren't playing a lot of football. And just naturally, I think there's a different air about players like that. And the Conte, it's no coincidence that you'll hear him rave about Doherty, about Rodon, about Bergwijn uh, and Lucas. And that's because behind the scenes, when they're not playing, they're still giving everything to try and prove him wrong. And maybe naturally some of those other players perhaps have drifted away from that because they just felt there was no chance for them. And I think getting them out the door, and I mean, that's probably harsh on Brian Hill. He's probably a slightly different case. I think Conte just felt he wasn't ready for the Premier League. But it was just a tighter squad. It was a squad with better balance in certain areas. And let's be honest, I don't know about you guys, but certainly me, there was an element of me thinking... They've had this whole window and just perhaps has gone back to his old club on the last day and just asked for a couple of favours kind of thing. And, you know, ultimately, that's so wrong. <laughs> it was proved to be so wrong because they've signed, you know, two players who, as I said before, absolutely suited to the Premier League, absolutely suited to Tottenham Hotspur. With Benton Kerr, which I just find incredible the more and more I think about it, he ticks every single box. He's experienced... But yet he's 24, so he fits yeah. Tottenham's profile of signing. The guy has won three Serie A titles, two Coppa Italias, two um, Primera divisions in Argentina. And especially Juve's last Serie A title, he was pivotal in that in the midfield. I'm sorry, but anyone that now says from now on that, you know, you can't do big business in the January transfer window, that's gone. That's wrong. You can't do it. You can get, we, that, this is now proved you can get the best players that you need. Mm -hmm. Because those yeah, two players, it, phenomenal. And, and it just goes to just quickly interact there. You know, I, I've, I've, I've banged the drum about bad recruitment for a long, long time. And I think that, you know, um, the, the, the recruitment at Tottenham, and, and I'll give you a, a later on example when, when we get towards the end of the show uh, of a, another club, but the recruitment at Tottenham has been woeful. Like, let's have it right. You know, I'm, I, I think I can say that because I'm not associated with anything. So, you know, the reality is it's been bad. Um, and... Previous to, you know, when Poch first came in in 2014, May 2014 or something like that, when, when we had the likes of, you know, Paul and the, some, some of the other scouting um, set up there, Poch had to get rid of a few players, didn't he? Like, you know, we, we turned in the press or whatever as bad eggs and this, that, and that. We yeah. had to change this stuff. stuff right? But we brought we brought players in quite, quite well. You know, the likes of Eric Dyer, for example, still cleared at the club and just had, I think, one of his best seasons ever uh, in, in, in a Spurs shirt. And, you know, but but we went through a lull of that recruitment part of it being really, really bad. If we get it right, and I think, Jen, yeah, echoing your point, Alistair, if we, if we can get it right like we did in January, there's no reason why this, this club can't go on again in the summer. Because 
bad, but you know, somebody said it in the comments earlier, Chingland and Bele, we all know he's got talent, but he's, he doesn't. He, I mean, I think he's been benched now for Leon, isn't he? Correct me if I'm wrong. He can't even get a game at Leon. So, you know, there's something not right with, with the behavior and the psyche around that, that particular individual. And he wasn't right for us, didn't fit. Um, and we've got to stamp that out because you go and spend 60 million on a player, he has to light up the Premier League. Uh, look at Luis Diaz. I mean, I know we went in for him, 37 million. He's lit it up. Uh, Kulusevski, I mean, his his numbers are, are a joke. They're actually a joke. And, and, and uh, in a good way for us, of course. But, you know, he's he's five goals and eight assists in 18 appearances in the Premier League. That is just yeah, unbelievable. Incredible. So you can yeah. find... And, and I think you said it earlier this week, Ali, on your video, um, or it might have been on the podcast. I can't remember which one it was. But you said... From a from a deal perspective as well, value for Decky is just it's just incredible value, isn't it? Yeah, and Bensonker. Bensonker's yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. I think Bensonker's something like around fifteen million, and then maybe with another five eventually. Um, and that even that's payable over something like three to five years. And and Kudusevsky, you know, it seems like they're going to keep him on loan now for next season, then do the deal the next summer. And even that deal itself, I think, is payable over five years. It is. Yeah. I know we, we like to bash Daniel Levy for the financial side of things, but also in moments like that, you've just got to kind of tip your hat because at that point, they weren't entirely sure where money was going to go COVID-wise, where the pandemic was going to stretch on, what was going to happen. They didn't know they were going to have a full season, so they had to be really clever with the deals. And they were phenomenal deals. They were. Yeah, yeah, and I think yeah. it's really interesting. When you say about Tongi, Tongi was a gamble. He was. He was a gamble that Poch really wanted him. And so they thought, you know what? He is one of the most talented young players in Europe. Let's go for it. Let's do it. Poch can work his wonders with him. But unfortunately, everyone believes they can change a player. Everyone believes that they're the player whisperer that can change the past and what they've done. And unfortunately, you know, anyone knows I'm one of Tongi's biggest fans. That man can do things with a football that others just dream of on a pitch. But ultimately, <sighs> you've got to make someone want it enough. And I just don't think, and like you say, even going back to Leon, they thought he was going to be the game changer for them. And I think they've missed out on European football at the end of the season. And he's, to be fair, he's had a couple of injuries, which is why I don't think he's been playing as much. But, you know, let's be honest, Leon aren't going to take £54 million option to buy. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Um, so, yeah, it, I think he's one of those players. He's, I think I'd hope for him it's a bit of a crossroads in his career and he just needs to finally click like, OK, it's not all the various clubs and managers I've worked for. Maybe it's me. Um, yeah. But yeah, and that, that's the transfer market. There's always a gamble element to it. Yeah, just just quickly, Rick, sorry. Chris Callan always says uh, on his show and on our show as well, 518 days uh, during that period of time when we didn't sign anyone. You would hope that maybe we learned our lesson and we, we signed two players in January of that quality we've been talking about. Because the other, the other teams in the top four race didn't sign anyone. And, and don't forget, Wolves were in that race as well. We had Wolves, Manchester United, Ch uh, Tottenham, Arsenal and West Ham. And the only club to sign any players in January transfer and it was Tottenham Hotspur. So, you know, again, you've got to duff your cap because I think that's what got us in the top four. Honestly, yeah. down the road at Arsenal, that is all they say. That They say that's the reason why Spurs got it, was that day in January. That's it. Yeah, yeah. Um Ali, coming over to you uh, again, obviously, uh, Rodrigo Bentecourt, Dijan Kulisevsky. I mean, initially, we obviously saw th their impact and how well they performed. It's funny that people judged uh, Decky after 20 minutes and only thought he wasn't good enough, which was quite funny. As his typical Spurs fans, just the, just, the, just the lack of optimism. So there's my there's my negative for the evening. But however, and going on to this, Spurs were eliminated from the League Cup by Chelsea in the semi-finals. We then went down to Borough in the fifth round of the FA Cup to ensure a 14th consecutive season that we would be without a trophy. How frustrating was it, Ali, both of those domestic cover upsets? And was it a real opportunity missed to end that trophy drought? It, well, yeah. I, I mean, of course it was. I mean, you know, Conte's, he, he's, he, he's got history in domestic cups. You know, he knows what he's doing. It's not exactly like he's a newcomer to that either. Um, yeah, it was. That, was. that was a disappointing night. Spurs, you know, especially coming off the back of the Leeds win, wasn't it? I think that one as well was at the 4 0 at Leeds. So they were going through that phase, weren't they, at the time of the win loss, win loss, win loss. And they just absolutely 
they were terrible that night at Riverside. We were all kind of watching on thinking, we kind of all felt that Middlesbrough were going to do it that night. They're just The more the game went on, the more they looked like the ones that were going to win it. Um, and yeah, it was, it was. But again, did it ultimately play its part? Did it free up time? Did it free up more training pitch time? And it's one of those weird scenarios where no one wants to ever give up silver where they don't at all. But probably did eventually end up playing its part in, in more time for Conte to have a mini pre-season of thoughts with his players. Yeah, just to touch on that, that weird run, as you mentioned there, where we kind of had that, that streak of winning a game and then losing a game. Of course, just before that, we saw us, I think it was in late January, we lost, of course, lost her on the bounce. We lost to Chelsea away. Uh, we lost to, uh, and then we lost those two home games where, you know, after coming out of them against Southampton and, and Wolves, I was kind of thinking, there's no chance of the top four now. Um, but then, of course, we emphatically responded with that massive win at Man City. Then we went on that, that run, as you said, I mean, that was that was just such a weird, weird period in time. I mean, what did you make of that that uh, inconsistent run? <laughs> you imagine reporting on that. Honestly, <laughs> try and write these stories or doing videos after that. You know, people talk about the way I start my videos. I'm like, oh, I'm like a nut in those ones. You just my face is up and down every single start. Um, but we kind of knew that was going to happen. I think that was what frustrated Conte the most was the inconsistency and the kind of the lack of ability in his players, just to, to have the same amount of drive for different games. He couldn't fathom that. Because obviously he's been in charge of teams that have like won almost every game of the season or barely lost a game. And as as he would later to say to us, you know, if you don't feel you can win a game, just don't lose it. That's the key thing. And, and Spurs just kept chucking them away. And especially those two home ones, you know, Southampton and Wolves. They were appalling performances for a home team. They looked like the away team in both matches. They were so, so bad. Um, yeah, it was it was a nightmare to report on because you couldn't get overexcited about any performance because you knew the next one, the same player, could be dreadful. Um, but likewise, you couldn't go overboard in criticism because you knew the next match they might have scored two or three goals at the same player. Mm. Um, but yeah, somehow... Somehow they came through at the other end. And I don't know how, but they did. Well, Conte, I think, is the reason. Just, just on that. I mean, on those two kind of those big defeats against Wolves and Southampton, I think one player was missing, and uh, I think deserves such credit this season was Eric Dyer, and that's why I yeah. kind of feel as though where he deserves a lot of credit, where and that really showed why he yeah, deserves right. so much credit. That, in that game, he was missing all over the place, weren't we? And defensively, and there was just no leader in that back line, and. Um, it just really showed, you know, we're all over the place. And um, he came, I think he came straight back into the team. And I think, mm. was it Man City that he came back came back into the team? I, I think it might have been. But, I mean, those two games for me just totally showed why Dyer deserves so much credit, why I think he's going to be good enough to be at the heart of our defence next season. Because although maybe he's not the best central defender in the Premier League, I think his leadership and his organising of the back line, I think that that's kind of what makes him such a good player and such an important player for Spurs. Agree. Yeah. I agree. John, let's, let's come over to you, John. Finally, we've finally got a positive part for John. But he's had to play the he's had to play the pat of mine villain all night, poor bloke. John, over to you. Yeah, no, I'm pleased I can talk about this one because it's probably one of my favourite games of the season, and that was the amazing win at Manchester City. It was a game that was peak Conte football. It was Harry Kane delivering on the biggest stage in front of the manager who wanted to buy him and showing everybody why he is the best out and out forward in world football for me. Um, he really delivered. And do you feel like Conte needed that result with Tottenham? to show that Tottenham could do big things and give the players that confidence to then go on and push us over the line later on in the season? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I'm trying to think Liverpool, Liverpool draw was before that, wasn't it? So I think I think you've got a kind of indication then that, you know, they could play in big games. I do think that. But certainly the Man City to go there and win a game, not even, you know, I don't even think the... the you know, the most confident City fan could say that Spurs came and snatched the points. It wasn't the case at all. They played incredibly well that day. Um, I'm sure some bitter ones maybe would, but, you know, they were fantastic that day. And you think about the players that were kind of out there as well. It was another big game for Ryan Sessegnon. Another day when he kind of defensively was so tactically mature that day, disciplined in the way he played, and then ultimately also played a part attacking-wise in, in one of the goals as well. I think it was the day that Kulusevski really came of age as a Premier League star in the making. I thought he was superb that day. Sonny obviously always gives City a nightmare. And I think also it was it was probably the game when Kane just reminded the world how good he is. 
You know, obviously he'd been starting to come back and starting to score the goals, but this was, let's be honest, against the team he wanted to join last summer. There's no getting around it. And it was a real, there you go, this is what you've missed out on kind of performance as well. And I think Conte just kind of looked at his team and, and you look at Kulisevsky, Son and Kane, and I think that night they really started to forge that idea that that could be one of the best attacking tridents in European football. It really can. If you think about it, the little amount of time they'd had even at that point to play together, yet they're playing like they've played for five, six seasons together. Just incredible kind of interplay. And, you know, Benton Kona-Hoybier, that partnership was really forming in the midfield. Um, and it was it, it was it was the back three that we obviously we saw for the, the, the kind of remainder of the season and how solid they were looking. It, it was a brilliant night. I, was so, I must admit, that was one of those nights I think I was staying over. I think it was one of those, because it was a later game, I had to stay over and I was dreading a kind of what my match report, all the stuff I was going to have to write late tonight was going to be about. And it ended up being something so completely different because it did it. It shook up the title race. This is the thing. I don't want Liverpool moaning about Spurs at the end of the season because Spurs gave Liverpool every chance of winning that league title with what they did against City in both games. They, they were superb. Even in the first game with Nuno, you know, I, I really felt that Spurs probably deserved that result on the, on the day because of the way they played. And, you know, we kicked about Jaffa Tenganga and some of his defending that day was incredible. But... Uh, yeah, no, brilliant night at the Etihad. In those big, I mean, in those big games this season, we were just so good. I mean, you look at the, I think I saw a stat of the the top four head to head, and, and Spurs had the same record as Chelsea and Man City in those games. And you know, even above Liverpool, who drew, I think they drew all six of their matches against the rest of the, the top four. But I mean, our, our record against you know the rest of the top four was, has been really impressive this year. And I think there's something maybe in the past where. Spurs have been criticised for, but... Potch definitely got pelted for that, didn't he, Jamie? Yeah, Potch he did, definitely yeah, got sure. pelted I for mean, that. There was obviously, I still remember back and we still had some big moments against the big teams, but, you know, he's fought, I think, three times at least. Conte's done a job on Klopp twice and on, 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 on Guardiola, so... Yeah. And, you know, he's competing with them, so, yeah, again, what a manager we have. I totally agree, Lee. Okay. It's okay. only for yeah. a wet night. Oh, mate, a wet, windy night in Burnley. And this was, uh, and Ali was there again as well, clearly. But just quickly on that Man City piece. Um, obviously, they won the league this year for nine, with 93 points. They had three losses. Two of them losses were against Spurs. I mean, again, probably couldn't make that up at the beginning of the season. But, uh, yeah, for, for all, like you say, Ali, for all the Liverpool moaners, we, we beat them twice, done them a favour. Um, but over to Burnley, and it was wet, and it was windy, and it was disgusting, and it was Burnley, and the weather was gross. And we went up there. After that, an amazing win in the 95th minute and a, uh, and a run of straight, a free straight league defeats, um, pricked the bubble of self confidence that had been created after that, that initial run. Uh, the 1 0 loss in Burnley in February. Uh, Antonio Conte was appearing to be threatening to leave. We'll get the, we'll get the lowdown on that. Ali was there clearly in the press conference, admitting the job was far harder than he'd ever envisaged following a fourth defeat in five Premier League games. That left us eighth and seven points. Yes, Arsenal fans that are in this uh, chat right now. Seven points off Champions League place back then. Um, Ali, can you give us a feeling of what that post-match press conference was all about when basically, let's be honest, Conte lost it. <laughs> and and it was, it was uh, forgive the pun, it was gold from a press conference perspective. It was. Do you know, the funniest thing since then is that it came out... What was it about a few weeks later? Because we kept talking about how emotional he was, and he came out and it was all like, you know what? Uh, it was all tactical. It was all part of my plan. <laughs> and then a couple of weeks ago, he admitted to us, "Well, you saw how I lost it that night in Burnley." Like, well, <laughs> <laughs> but what you said it was all part of your tactics, you know. Uh, but it was incredible. And I mean, and actually, it reminded me to think about that match because there was another little sequence. It wasn't just win loss, win loss. I think if I remember right. Every time Spurs and Conte kept the same level, they went and lost the next match as well. That was another little sequence that was going on. And I was just, you know, thinking about it. That was the same eleven that beat Man City. Put them out at Turf Moor against Burnley. You've just beaten the champions 3-2. And they go out. And honestly, they barely had a shot on target that was worth even thinking about. There was, it's just... And I think he just lost it that night. I, and I understand that he didn't say a word to the players afterwards. Just it snubbed them all. Just was like, I'm not even having you. You know, you, you just you you stew in what you've done, like a kind of disappointed teacher type thing. 
And then he came out to us, and yeah, I can't remember if it was my, it might have been my question, it might have been someone else's. He just went, maybe I'm not good enough. Maybe it's me. If I'm the, if I'm the solution, if the solution is me not being here, then that's what we do. And from what I gather, behind the scenes, that absolutely scared the whatever's out of those players. Really? I think they suddenly realised, you know what? Maybe it's us. Because, you know, if even one of the best managers in the world is willing to walk out because we can't do this. We can't beat City and then go and beat Burnley. And with no disrespect to them, you know what you're going to get at Burnley. It's not, even like, it's not even like you should be shocked by the fact that it's wet, windy and horrible. I think we had a hailstorm at one point <laughs> as well. I think during the press conference, I remember, we couldn't hear Sean Dyche over the Zoom thing because the hail was hitting the stadium so hard. So you know what Burnley's going to be like. It's not going to be like a day in Tenerife. So I don't understand why they would have gone with any preconceptions of anything else. And he was so angry with them. And I do generally think that night was another night, two nights, the top four became a reality. because, mm -hmm. And it didn't feel like it at the time. It really didn't. But I just think he absolutely knocked the stuff out of a few of those players. And even the star names, talking about the big names as well, who maybe felt they were untouchable and everything. I think they suddenly realised, yeah, we're all in this same boat. And, um, yeah, it was, <laughs> what a night. I'm just, just remembering back to it. It was, just, it was horrible. Because I'd already had... Because we'd had the postponed snow game. So that was the yeah, match yeah. that I drove all the way up there in crap conditions, got there, had some bloke shout at me as I'm getting out of the car, I mean, you've just postponed it. I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I literally what, just went, in, went to the loo, got back in my car, drove back to six or so hours back again. So then to come all the way back up and have that served up, it was just incredible. But I hopefully it served its purpose. I don't forget because of that uh, obviously the postponed game there was Dice just out there in his in his shirt trying to trying to make a point that you know I'm on oh. I can handle I can handle this I can handle this weather conditions it's brilliant John let's throw it back around to you mate yeah glad I can have another more positive one we all survived the Burnley debacle Alistair going up twice and we came back with two back to back wins a big four 0 win over Leeds up at Ellen Road really impressive win actually a few different goal scorers I remember Kulovetsky got another good one up there and then we destroyed Everton five 0 um, at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. Did you feel at that point the, the benefit of only having the one game a week to play was really starting to show on the players, Alistair, in terms of, you know, Conte could work with them all week on those pitch stars, no way, and we were seeing dominant performances and clean sheets? Yeah, I think that apart from the Middlesbrough, I think that was that was in the middle, wasn't it, of those two. But apart from that, yes, I think you could start to see it come along. I always remember the Everton one because I feel sorry for Guesty. Guesty, who I work with, he's, he's, you know, he makes no secret. He is an Everton fan. And he said to me, he made the serious mistake as we were walking up to the press box of going, yeah, I think Everton are going to do something tonight. I think there's something, you know, I think they're going to, uh, I think they might, might kind of hold up Spurs a bit here, maybe get a point, maybe even three. And it's like, I just turned to me and I was like, mate, it's 5 0. <laughs> it was like the complete opposite of what you predicted was going to happen. I felt so sorry for him. And obviously, he hadn't. Worse to come with all the uh, the games that Everton had after that. But yeah, you, you could see it. You could see a reaction to the Burnley game. You could see a difference in training. You could see a more, um, how do I put it? I suppose in their attacking, they were more determined. There was more chance creation. Everything was a, a real knock on effect of a match at Burnley where yeah, they created so little. Um, although it would obviously come later back to a similar, weirdly, very similar. Um, Brighton and uh, Brentford later on in the state this season. It was very much like that Burnley game. Um, but yeah, no, no, certainly in the weeks ahead, you, you notice the change. You notice the change in the players. It was like a refocus. I'm trying to remember what game it was after. It might have been the West Ham one, which we may be about to talk about. But I think Conte started to realise he needed to give the players a target. And that was when we started to hear it went from... Champions League, you know, essentially you're having a laugh, to Champions League should be the target. That's what we should go for. And I think you just noticed the change in mentality when they suddenly had a target. And it may be that he said that behind the scenes to them. Like, you know, we can do this, lads. And, and to be fair, he was right if he did say that. Yeah, totally agree. Jay, I'm going to steer it over to you. Uh, just looking at our script... Because we're just a little bit caught for time. We are going to have to speed it up a bit like Adama Traore. And we may get an alley impression of that later. So we're going to steer back around to Jamie. Who's going to take... Traore. <laughs> <laughs> who's, 
Who's going to take the point of the United defeat? Unfortunately, uh, uh, Jamie, let's give it over to you. Cool. Um, so, of course, after that Burnley game, we had that emphatic performance at Leeds where we won, I think we won 5-0. And I think in that game, we really kind of showed um, signs of, of being a real Conte side because we had, uh, Do- uh, I think it was Doherty and Emerson, uh, Doherty, Doherty and Session combining really well. I think it was for the, I think it might have been the first goal. I think the two combined um, and Doherty obviously scored. But in that game, was that kind of re- really where we started to see a Conte side really starting to form? And of course, on that day as well, we saw... Uh, Harry Kane and Chung Min Son break the record for the most goal combinations in the Premier League. So was that the game where we really started to see kind of the best of a Conte team, even after that that awful defeat at Burnley? You know, the funny thing is that I'm now being asked that question, and that was the question I asked Conte after that match. That was really weird. <laughs> <laughs> what a strange kind of way that's come back that around. That's crazy. Yeah, no, I asked him exactly that. I said, was this the first real glimpse we got of how your Tottenham Hotspur should look? You know, because we know there's so much emphasis on how the wing-backs play. And I think we've noticed that whenever Spurs have a rough game where they haven't created much, it's because the wing-backs have had bad days because there was so much emphasis on getting the ball into that box and then becoming essentially like making it a front five in a way. Um, And yeah. It was, Matt, I was so delighted for Matt Doherty. I was so delighted to see him kind of, he got so much pelters. Look, we all do it, journalists, fans, whatever. We decide someone, we write them off, that's it, they're done. But in essence, he was a guy that was never really playing in the position that he was a natural in. And in shock horror, he gets a run in the position he's best at. And, you know, he's probably saved his first career. I think he may well, you know, be one of the the kind of contenders for that right wing back slot next season. Um, and then on the other side, like I say, poor old Sess, 21 years old, had a good loan at Hoffenheim, but we just know his hamstring problems are there for all to see. That's always kept him kind of fragmenting his appearances. And I think that was a day, you know, when he started to get a little bit of belief. And then what happens? Everton match, you know, I think he, didn't he get an assist and then get the injury, I think, against Everton? I feel like he did. Yeah, he did. He did. Yeah, yeah, and it was just so unfortunate. I'm so glad he ended up having the end of the season that he did, because if that had only been the glimpse we got, and you know what, I think that's when we saw, like you say, we saw the Conte team in action exactly how it was meant to look, yeah. and it brought goals <laughs> and a lot of them. Yeah. Totally agree. What we will do is we will go just for our final break of the show uh, for our listeners and audio, for our watchers on YouTube, still nearly 1,500 of you plus watchers live. Thank you ever so much. We're approaching the hour and a half mark. So for Ali and his family's sake, we are going to try, and also the guys here, we are going to try and speed it up, I do promise you. But just a very quick and have a shout out from our sponsors tonight, Beavertown Corner Pin. That's the Beavertown Bang opposite the South Stand as we've been celebrating doing some great home and away features across this season, we've been down there. The boys have been there. Uh, listen, there's been some great atmosphere there. Go and check them out. We had Lee McQueen from the Laser Crush back to the Neck Oil. He'll be back down there for pre-season. We'll be looking forward to going back down to Beaver Town, where, of course, uh, Spurs in the Champions League. There'll be many, many great nights to come back at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. We're looking forward to joining that. Right, Ali, despite a very disappointing 3 2 defeat away to Man United, with Ronaldo really being the only difference in that game, as we saw, Spurs are very lucky not to take all the points back to North London. Arsenal at the time was six points ahead and played a game less in fourth. Bouncing back again, we travelled to Brighton. Kane's seventh goal in six games, sealed a 2 0 win for Spurs. Uh, it saw Christian Romero get his first goal for the club. We saw Harry Kane and that Coca Cola, well, celebration where the Coke ended up in some form of the crowd. And we really did gain some great momentum with three more wins, beating West Ham 3 1, Newcastle 5 1, Villa 4 0 away. It was kind of referencing the point you said there about goals that kept on coming. Spurs scoring 12 in that period, considering just the two. Sonny notching another six in the process to really chase down Mohamed Salah for that golden boot. It felt like during that period that we saw every single player, Ali, confident in their roles, knowing their job. And it even felt at that point we could run away with maybe even getting, you know, securing top four and walking with it. I mean, were you surprised by just how strong Spurs were during that period in our great goal scoring form? It was just momentum. That's what it was. Even Man U match, I think they played pretty well that day. And it was essentially really Ronaldo who was the difference for United. Take take him out of that. And I think Spurs had played pretty well on the day. Um, so they broke the win-loss um, record that day. You know, they... they um, with the Brighton and the West Ham games. They, they switched that up and, and started to put momentum together. And obviously that started to turn out into win after win until that bizarre little patch with the, the Brighton and the Brentford ones. 
And that's even that, you, you kind of look back at that and you look at the Brighton uh, game and you just think, if you just just not conceded that late goal, like Conte said, made sure it was even a draw, they wouldn't even have to worry about the last day at Norwich. You know, they'd have been there. It's just funny, those little kind of moments. Um, but yeah, it was all about momentum. It was all about playing a game a week, essentially. Um, about Conte having the team out there he wanted pretty much, barring obviously the Sessignon injury. Um, and even players like Emerson Royale, you know, who's, you know, we, we know as a wing back, that's not really where he's meant to play. But even he, that they kind of worked out a system with Kulisevsky where Emerson was asked to do less attacking. He was less going to be the man that crossed the ball into the box because I think people have heard me say this before. There's a little joke in the press area that when Spurs win a corner from Emerson Royale, that's best case scenario. And that's kind of something to be happy about. Um, but they kind of almost, I think, whether Conte recognised it or something, but it was very much was made clear to Kulisevsky, you stay out wide. Don't worry, Emerson, you just defend. And do you know what? Fair play to him because his defending has been really, really good since he kind of made that switch. And I think that's all it is. I think it's just Conte learned more about his team as the, as every passing week went on. He learned more about each player, the strengths and weaknesses. And that's why they, they finished so strong. You know, winning 10 of your last 14 matches, that's that's almost champions form. That's almost up. That is superb. Yeah, agree. Lee, let's do it over to you. Yeah, so uh, the, the the big man from Sweden's finding his feet and Kane's rediscovering his goal-scoring touch. Son is just simply being Son, um, just being absolutely brilliant. Tottenham soon took control of the top four race. However, last gas winner, I think it took the wind out of our sours. Trossard gave Brighton a shot win and a home defeat for the Spurs. I think, Ali, you just referenced it there as well about kind of, you know, if you can't win, don't lose. And I think that was a really good statement, I think, or uh, saying that, that Conte said that, that part because actually it started making the fans think, actually, you're not going to win every single game, but make sure in certain games that you don't lose. And it, it actually is so logical, isn't it? Um, but we, we we followed that up with, again, a very flat nil-nil on the road with Brentford, but at least the message was getting thing. I think we didn't have any shots on target in either of them two games. I think Brentford, from memory, had five shots on target that game. And and obviously, we couldn't win that game, but we didn't lose it. And again, that became quite crucial. We slipped to fifth, two points behind uh, <coughs> Arsenal, sorry. <laughs> uh, looking back now, Ali, if Spurs had beaten the likes of Brighton and Brentford, as you just mentioned, could we have even finished third? I mean, the you know, Conte referred to the gap between us and Chelsea as being a very important gap. And all of a sudden... We finished, what, three points behind them. Could, could we have... I mean, I could have, should have, would have, but we could have easily finished above them again, couldn't we? Maybe. We've, we've had this discussion about us as a journalist as well. It's one of those where I think we've looked at the points, oh, what if they've done this, what if they've done that? But I think Chelsea took their foot off the gas. And I think had they had genuine competition for finishing third, I think they probably would have put their foot on it again. Yeah, um, but you know, like you say, you know, bringing up the the if you uh, if you can't win, don't lose. The moment he said that, Spurs didn't lose another game, did they? No. And I just think no, that's, no, that's no, so point. crucial. Yeah. Yeah. It just so shows how they listen. They hang on. Honestly, everyone in this club, players, staff, everyone, they hang on his every word, and uh, it's just little, little things like that that just kind of make you almost even more excited about next season as well because. Exactly. He's the man that if they can get higher up the table and they are fighting, in his words, for bigger things, he knows what he's talking about. He's been there and done it. And I think the players feed off that. That, you know, some of the interviews we've had with the players and you've read about other ones they've had, the man is just, he's just someone you absorb everything you possibly can from. And, and you can see that as the season has gone on, the team has got more tactically intelligent with every game. And, uh, yeah, even little hiccups like the Brighton game, they learned from it and, and turned it to their advantage. And they agree. After that yeah. game, obviously, we had the 3-1 win over Leicester City um, with Sonny grabbing a brace. So then we came into the big one. And one of my favourite games of the season, as I'm sure for many Tottenham fans, was that night at Anfield. We went into that. Loads of people had that down as a predicted loss. You know, that's a game Tottenham weren't getting points. But we stood up for ourselves. We, we, we battled hard and we deserved more, in fact, from the game. For the performance, you know, I thought, I thought Romero was outstanding that night. Um, all the guys at the back, Hugo as well. Um, and, and unfortunately, it was just that deflected goal that got Liverpool back in the game. But uh, overall, Ali, I mean, how much of a 
a huge caveat was that point in terms of getting us over the line. And, and again, like that Man City win, showing the players, these are the nights we want to be playing on. These are the big occasions when everyone's watching, your Canes, your Sonnies, your Romeros, your Hugos. This is where we want to be as a club. And we really showed that on that night, I thought. What did you think, Ali? Yeah. 100%, 100%. It was a night when, kind of in a converse way to the, the winning and not losing, thing. everyone said Spurs had to win that game. They have to win. It doesn't matter. They have to go there yeah, and get yeah. the three points. And it ended up, the point was brilliant. The point was actually ended up kind of being exactly what they needed. Um, there were so many big performances that night. You know, it's like, you know, all the players you mentioned, and then Ben Davies as well. You know, Ben Davies used to have that thing kind of put on him, like, oh, Mane is going to tear him apart. It used to always be the thing, didn't it? Because I think there was one night in Anfield where he unfortunately, as many other players on the left-hand side have had, they've been, you know, ripped apart by the pace of Mane. But I thought Ben Davies, the whole back three on that night. I mean, Lloris had so few shots on target to actually deal with on the day. It was incredible. And like you say, it had to end up being a deflected shot. And of course, it had to come from Diaz. Um, but no... Spurs, that's pretty, I think it was a night when Romero showed that if, if anyone, there's some people, like some of the Liverpool journalists around me were like, God, Romero's good, isn't it? I was like, have you just noticed? <laughs> it's like, yeah. it had to be in a game like this. That's diving edda, buddy. Oh. That's diving edda. That is just yeah. absolute class. So commanding, the bloke. Uh, I remember, he I remember when, he, when he signed, we were all kind of hoping behind our, you know, behind our couch, if you like, thinking, could he be our VV uh, Virgil van Dijk? Could he? I'm, I'm putting it out there. I think he is. I think you know Diaz. Uh, you know, um, you know the defender Diaz. Why right? not? Not the other one. Yeah. Um, for Man City and Virgil Van Dijk and Romero. I think he's had that impact on Tottenham that Virgil Van Dijk and Diaz had on City and Liverpool respectively. Yeah, I think Carragher didn't Carragher name his signing of the season. Yeah, yeah. 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 He's super. He's such a player, and I love the fact that. Again, it's another Conte thing, and it shows it's been listened to. We were asked Conte about Romero, and it, he'd play him down a bit. He didn't want him to get too carried away. And there was one day he said, you know, talking about his tackles. There's days when he can't, he needs to learn when to tackle and when to not, and all of this. And shock horror from that moment on, a bit like the win loss thing, his yellow cards disappeared. They did, and it's just incredible, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, if we, we were at one point thinking if he gets booked, it was it against Brighton? He might be banned for two games and he might miss the Arsenal game and whatever. And like, I don't think he got booked since that. That when you yeah. when you said that, that's crazy. Yeah, yeah. yeah it is also, mad. He took it all on. He takes took it all on board. Yeah, one of my favourite moments from Mera was that tackle just before I think it was the second goal against Leicester City where he goes flying. Oh, yeah. in the time you hear the noise. The noise. I mean, that was just like an yeah. unbelievable. Tackle. I, I love a crunching tackle. But anyway, as, as I think as the comment says here on screen, of course, the Arsenal match, um, obviously a game which was rearranged. I think it was meant to be back on, it was meant to be uh, in January. Of course, Arsenal decided they didn't want to turn up for that one. Um, I think you could also argue the same, that they didn't want to turn up for, for this one either, or, you know, certainly didn't look like they turned up. But of course, you know, it was the start of what's been almost, you know, one of the best fortnights supporting Spurs. Um, but I mean that that night at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium was just unbelievable. The support, you know, the supporters were amazing. Of course, as we got on, on the background here, you know, you had that amazing tifo at the stadium. I mean, how how much of a part did that atmosphere play in that victory? And then, of course, I think the the guys in, in the studio on Monday Night Football they spoke about it after the uh, the Newcastle the the game where Arsenal lost at Newcastle, and they said that you know that was the game which really turned it for Arsenal. But, I mean, how much of an impact do you think that game had on Spurs getting that fourth place in the end? Uh, it, it, it was spine tingling. It's such a cliche, the whole 12th man thing. But it was true. It was true that night. They played such a part. It was really interesting because early on, I didn't actually think it did. I actually thought Arsenal probably dealt with it better than the opening minutes. They probably had a slightly better handle on it. And then just slowly, just... It's almost like the crowd started to get in. I was going to say their heads. One man said it was Rob Holding. Let's be honest. You know, as, as I think I've said before, the most apt name possible for a footballer in that North London derby because he robbed them of the chances because he kept constantly holding the whole time. And it was just, ah, uh, if ever Spurs could have dreamt of the first half of how that match would go, that was how it would go. It was just, the crowd were just, I don't think I've ever heard noise and consistent noise like that night at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. You know, we spoke about the Liverpool game earlier. Everyone was raving. I had this guy next to me who was clearly a, 
maybe it's something to do with Liverpool. He was some kind of pundit. He just kept on. Oh, isn't this the most amazing atmosphere you've ever heard? Uh, so I, I wanted to try and I couldn't be too honest with him because he obviously would have got very upset. But for me at Anfield, it was like 15 minutes at the start of the first half, 15 minutes at the start of the second half, and after they scored, they were kind of the only moments of real atmosphere. North London derby was noise for 90 minutes, just pounding at Arsenal. Yeah. And Arsenal just collapsed as it went on because they, they just it was just absolutely overwhelmed by it. And it was, yeah, yeah one of those pleasure to be there kind of nights. Yeah. It, it, it was just, I have to interact with that because I, I, can't, I can't not say anything about that night. It was absolutely unbelievable. I mean, I sit it, where the TIFO is. I sit in the first E on the dare bit. That's where I sit, like in that E bit, right? In the middle of the E. And it was just incredible in that South State, like the whole stadium. And I, I, I'll be honest with you, lads, you, you know this from the group. I was absolutely convinced weeks before that game that we would never lose it. I, I was more worried about the subsequent game that we'll talk about in a second, the Burnley, yeah, Burnley. than I was yeah. at the Arsenal game. Because for them running away from us in January and doing what they did to us, I just knew that we'd win. And, and we were so up for it. And I, I generally, Ali, you just said about like the 12th man thing. Uh, the 12 person thing. I, I generally think that the fans helped us get over the line in full but over the last kind of three, four weeks. I mean, the away fans, right? They're always amazing. Like I, I don't go to a lot of away games, I haven't got enough points, but but you know, a lot of people that do, and you go to all the games. But the home fans, there were some times in the home in the stadium at home where we were just drifting along in games, and we and and now now we've I think the fans have shown each other that's what it needs to be like. Does that make sense? Like, without getting carried away, that's what it needs to be a like. Fortress. A fortress. That's what it needs to be. Totally that. I mean, the the Burnley game, midday kickoff, 60 hours after um, after the Arsenal game. And we'd had two big games. Like, it was Liverpool, we just talked about Arsenal, and then the Burnley at 12 o'clock on a Sunday as well. I mean... When was the last time that even happened? When was that even a thing? A midday kickoff on a Sunday? I don't, I, you know, it's just bizarre. But, but I thought again, the atmosphere, THFC flags, Atspur song sheets that we've, we're doing some stuff with, and, and all the fans again made a massive effort to really drive that atmosphere. And I just thought that it was a bit nervy. Obviously, Kane's penalty, Pope didn't even move. And again, you've got to give this guy just a quick mention again, Kane. He takes penalties. I think it was his 21st out of 21 penalties taken that he scored, or 20 out of 20. And he and he's taken penalty against Ramsdale, who he practices against all the time in England. And then he takes penalty against Pope, who's done the same thing, and he still scores. I mean, I mean, it was just absolutely amazing, wasn't it, Ali? Oh, honestly, it, it, you'd bet your life on Harry Kane scoring a penalty, wouldn't you? If your life depended on it, you'd think anyone in the world would probably pick Harry Kane to take it. And... Every time that they're classic inside the post kind of penalties, aren't they? They're just drilled in. Most of the time, the keeper doesn't even move because they just can't even get to him. He is he's superb. And just, I was going to say, it's not in case I forget to say it before the end of this, because obviously we have this fantastic chant that we hear every, every week from Apparently, <laughs> I was told this the other day, he likes the chant because he doesn't kiss ginger. And I find that really, I find that really fascinating. That apparently, he's just like, why do they sing that about me? I don't get it, kind of thing. And uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, it's a little thing. Everyone sings that next time. Just think of his face; he's probably sitting there a little bit confused, thinking, "Not me." Yeah, no, the Burnley game was all about. It was all about showing that that mental strength, wasn't it? To just to get it over the line. And those last fifteen minutes, um, you know. Even, um, was it Joey Roden coming off the bench? Even a big header in the final big second. Header. Everyone playing their part. Um, it was just the relief. That final whistle when it went, that was a roar. They would have heard that down the road, I tell you, in North London, because that was a noise. It was brilliant. And then, of course, the Norwich game, just to, fi just to finish that piece off, there was a lot of nervousness around... Certainly, I'm I'm pretty, you know, I, I don't get that nervous most of the time. I'm positive. I'm like, yeah, we're going to go into... But I have to say, I was I was going through some emotions on that Norwich game. So I was thinking, oh, please, Spurs, come on. Because we've just seen uh, Newcastle just tear that lot down the road, a new one. Um, and it was just back in our hands. And we're thinking, well, all we've got to do is go and get a draw. Caught, surely, Tottenham, surely you're not going to mess this up. And of course, we didn't. But there was a few nerves around... 
uh, around some of us in the, in the group. But again, just for me, a, a massive professional job done. I mean, Norwich were woeful and we were just, we just, we just blew them away. We were just, we could have been nine. I think you said this this week, didn't you, Ali? I think we had 13 shots on target. Could have, We could have beaten them 9-0. I think Kane could have got that trick, to be fair, if you fancied it. Yeah, although fair, to be fair to Kane, I feel like his entire game was based around trying to get Son his goals, yeah. which says everything as, as well about the team. It really does. And I'd say, you know, I, and I was similar. I was before the match, I was thinking, oh, you know, we're so drilled into us that Spurs will find a way to ruin something. We, we know, we, unfortunately, that is just something that's drilled into us. But you know what? Those players were completely the opposite. No, all of them believed there were no nerves, apparently. They were all just very set on what they're doing. And weirdly, there was drama everywhere else, pretty much in the Premier League that day. And there was none of it. So the most dramatic thing happened with Spurs and uh, Norwich Spurs was whether someone was going to get a golden boot. And that was it. You know, everything else, they just did it so professionally. And were it not for Tim Krull, it could have been eight or nine nil on the day. Yeah, honestly, incredible. And that's a. It ends with Spurs being in the Champions League. And we've got a very, very exciting summer to look forward to. Now, we've nearly taken two hours of Ali's time. So, Ali, firstly, thank you ever so much for giving us your precious time on a day off, which I know people are waiting and want to see your diaries when you've got some more time booked off. <laughs> I can't believe that we stick out the list of questions, the most popular questions. When's Ali going to have some time off? I just honestly quite unbelievable. Um, Ali, just I've picked up a couple of questions on here. Um, yeah. I think what people would like to know very quickly is for you, who's been your favourite player of the season? I would have said in the first half of the season, seeing Skippy coming along and really proving himself to be a proper Premier League player and, and you know being an academy boy coming through was great. Second half, you could point to the January signings, you could point towards the, you know, the, the uh, Kane kind of coming back in, but for me... It's all about Sonny. Sonny was Sonny saved Spurs in so many matches. You know, I looked at some of the stats, and it's like since December, I think it was only seven matches where Sonny didn't score or provide an assist. Even when he wasn't having the best of days, he was still there for Tottenham when they needed. So, for me, he's just he had no equal. I don't think this season. Agree. I think, again, probably the many, the player of this season. I know Ben Secure's getting a name as well, getting a mention. Guys, listen, thank you so much for all the lovely comments coming in about Ali, about the show. Listen, we really all do appreciate it. Right, just very quickly, uh, Jamie, we know you've been running, a, obviously, a Twitch channel for most of the season. Jay, where can we uh, check that out? And also, any upcoming content for you, Jay? Yeah, I mean, the, the Twitch stuff, um, of course, is, as I said, Daily Hotspur. Uh, yeah, just go and check that out if you want to go and check it out, but... That's really Amazing, superb. John, John, are you running the, the youth pod as well? Lots going on. John, where can we find that? Please let us know. Yeah, loads going on. Just Lily White Rose podcast, all your normal podcast providers. It's going to be lots to talk about, actually, because alongside finishing the top four, we're back in the Youth Champions League next year, a tournament I value very, very highly. Loads yeah. to talk about next season, so I'm really looking forward to getting into that. Yeah, totally agree. Listen, John, looking forward to that as well. Lee, mate, it's been a busy season. Thank you so much, mate, for all your time. Um, We'll be back very soon. We we don't, I think, like, Ali, we're not going to take much of a break, are we? I, I, mean, just, I just want to quickly ask, Ali, just one more thing, which is where where do you think, and just quickly maybe around the table, but where do you think Tottenham can be next season? Do, do you think that... I'm going to give you some quick stats, right? Before you answer that question, I know, I know we've got, we're have got we going on, but... You've got to have a couple of hours, Ali, yeah? I've <laughs> right. got, got this out. I've got the blue book out, right? All right, but Ali, you've already a couple of hours. Yeah. I've always said that Spurs on the, uh, on a one cycle below Liverpool's trajectory. So we're, b- we're behind the cycle of Liverpool. And I find it's absolutely fascinating. In 2017-18 season, Liverpool finished full from 75 points. And in that January of during that season, they bought Virgil van Dijk. And in that in that summer, they bought Alisson, um, N- Naby Keita, Fabinho, Origi and Shaqiri. Right, that's who they bought. So they they, they had what five signings plus v, uh, Virgil Van Dijk in that January, and they took a seventy five point uh, points haul from that season seventeen eighteen into a ninety seven points haul in the following season. Right, come on, you know where I'm going with this now, boys. <laughs> uh, let's, let's I get an idea. Yeah. No, right. So so and and then also have a think about that. So so when people say to me. Tottenham can't do that. Well, Liverpool did it, right? So Liverpool, I've just I've just said that Liverpool did it. So with some really good recruitment, 150 million pounds war chest and all that stuff, 
Also, Romero, who we've just lauded on here, being the best defender that we've had, and, you know, Jamie Cagle, whatever. He missed 13 games this season. 13 for injury. And, and... We dropped points against, we dropped three points against Brighton, two points against Brentford, five points against Southampton, and three points against Wolves. So that's a total of 13 points that we've just found there with a fit Romero. You probably end up, you know, you know, I know Romero's fit with some of them, but, you know, we've put all that stuff together. Plus the fact that with that recruitment, can, can we? Can we bridge that gap? Can we? I'm putting it out there, lads. What are you saying? Let's get Ali to answer it. I think it's very exciting. I love that <laughs> idea. Um, that's a massive, massive improvement. Um, personally, I think I think Spurs will improve. I think you'll look at them maybe pushing those top teams and potentially finishing third because I think it's going to be a really interesting season for Chelsea and how they react to losing a lot of established players that have been like a, a real backbone of that team and, and how, you know, the new owners and how that all works. Um, but like I say, for Tottenham, it's going to be the juggling act to that Champions League as well. Getting back into the mindset of hmm. we really can't change our team too much up for two match, huge matches a week or, or three. Um, I, I think success would be a bit of silverware. And I think that's what they'll all want, whatever trophy that is is um and yeah i'd say push up next season to maybe third place and then like liverpool did continue to build in each window and then maybe in two seasons time you really are having to go up there yeah so i think we all we all hopefully share that optimism lee thank you so much mate, for all your time so we're we are back on sunday for our lws award of the season so player of the season goal of the season young player of the season we're doing that on sunday that'll be a team show the squad He's back in town, and then it's McQueen at the wheel, Benton Cure on a break. <laughs> and I can't bloody wait. Honestly, I tell you, nor can my wife either. She's been waiting for this. Take me out to the Greek islands where I cannot get any Wi Fi signals to Spurs. And for Ali's sake, don't do any bloody business. Wait till I'm back, please. Ali Gold, the wonderful Ali Gold. Ali, thank you so much for all of your time. Ali, please tell us where we can find you, even though everybody knows where you are. Where can we find Ali Gold? You know where I am, but all, all the usual places, YouTube and the Golden Guest Talk Tottenham podcast we do as well, and obviously Football.London. I'm all over the shop. You, you can't miss me. You're a legend, mate. Absolute legend. Generally, you are absolutely brilliant. Did top, did top, did top journal, mate. Superb. Honestly, did two hours in time. Thanks so much for having me. Honestly, it's been fantastic. Honestly, pleasure. Listen, from the wonderful Ali Gold, from the brilliant Jamie Brown, the epic John Wenham, the wonderful Lee McQueen. Guys, we are back with you. Sunday evening for the last word on Spurs squad special. Ali's checking the clock. We're also checking the clock. We are going to be leaving you in peace and let Ali keep exploring the war chest for us. No pressure on the man, but we want more videos. <laughs> Bring them to us. <laughs> from Ali, from all of us, guys, thank you so much for all your support this evening. As always, keep safe, keep well, and finally, come on you Spurs. <laughs>